We welcome you to our Sabbath service. To those of you in the house, welcome. We're here to worship and praise our great God, Jehovah God, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi. He's just amazing and he's worthy to be praised. And so we're going to praise him this morning. Amen. You ready to praise the Lord? Amen. Stand with me. We're going to welcome the presence of the Lord and then we're going to get started. Amen. Our God and our Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to bless your name. We praise you. We magnify you. We lift you up, God. We thank you this morning for the opportunity to be here in this place, in this space, where we can worship and praise you, Lord, in freedom. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have to worship you. Lord, we honor you. We honor you with the fruit of our lips, Father. We ask, oh God, that you would enter into this place. Fill our hearts, Father transform hearts father today transform lives today father i pray god that you'd bless this service i pray father that you would be with each and every one those who are on their way father bring them here safely we just bless your name and praise you and thank you for hearing this prayer in Jesus' name amen. Amen. amen amen would you be free from your burden of sin would you be free from your burden of sin yeah, yeah. there is power there's power in the blood of Jesus amen From your burden of sin, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. working power in the blood of the lamb amen we're gonna sing a new song this morning is that all right it's called you have made me glad so I, I just need you guys to listen to this first part as we sing it and if you guys already know it just sing right along with us you join us online at home too in the name of God we're gonna sing about his great works today you have made me glad 
Come on, put your hands together. Come on, church, it's okay to praise God this way. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, because he is great and worthy to be praised. Let's say, I give thanks. I give thanks to you, Lord, and sing praise to your name, O Most High. Declare your love in the morning. Your love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Wow, it's a beautiful day outside. Good morning. Good morning. We'd like to thank you for coming because church is open. Oh, that was, that, that, that was, um, hmm. Y'all don't seem happy that church is open, but church is open. Thank you. And, and every Sabbath, you know, our second service has been filling up. But first service is still a little challenge. But now, um, more and more of you are in the pews for first service. And so we're so happy that you are here. Thank you for, to all of you for continuing to mask up and keeping each other safe. So for those of you online who would like to join us next week or, or even our second service here this morning, you have an hour and a half to get ready and get yourself here. Don't forget to um, register yourself on Eventbrite and come join the family because we would love to see you here. And also, please come next week because I'm being commissioned during your second service and so we're excited about that. There's one thing that we did not get to do formally. And so I would like to invite our head elder, Elder Mozart. And his beautiful wife, Helange. Elder Mozart, as you know, has been serving us now as our head elder for a few months and he was only announced in our church business meeting but he hasn't been announced formally and so we would like to invite the rest of our elders and pastors up here this church family if you did not know this is our new head elder elder mozart porcina <laughs> having been trained by diligently by elder jack reader who, who is there and he's still functioning as our elder and he's still giving out hugs. So for those of you who haven't gotten a, a hug from Elder Jack and Elder Joanna today, we invite you to do so. And Elder Mozart, you have been such a fantastic example. You've only been serving for a few months to a year but you have been everywhere. Hasn't he been everywhere, church? Everywhere, being at everything and helping our church in, in your ministry. And so we thank you for that. Sister Helange, we thank you for your support and also the support of your family. <laughs> and we would just like to dedicate you to, formally dedicate you to God's service this morning. Pastor Rose, could I invite you to do the honors of praying over Elder Mozart? Sure. I really thank God that we can be in ministry together. Uh, this is a result of a grand conspiracy that started a few weeks ago <laughs> to ensure that we affirm Elder Mozart. We thank God for his willingness, his family's willingness to give of themselves here at the Plantation Church. And so, Father God, we thank you so much that you can use us, mere mortals, to do such an important work. We thank you so much for the Porcina family. What a tremendous gift they have been to our church. We thank you for their involvement in ministry. Today, we seek to acknowledge and affirm Elder Mozart, our first elder. We thank you, Lord, for his willingness to give of his time, to give of his resources, to give of the abilities that you have blessed him with to cause here at Plantation. We pray that you will surround him and his family. And as we, as a team, the pastors and the elders, as we come together, may we continue 
to move in the self same direction and so bless them keep them sanctify them we pray in Jesus name amen Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's time for a children's story, so I'd like all the children to come up for a children's story. There aren't many children this morning, but it'd be good if the ones that were here would come up. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for guarding, protecting us, and keeping us safe, and letting it be a good day today. Please continue to help it to be a good day today, and thank you for everything. In your prayer, amen. All right, so are you familiar with the story of Naaman? Yes? Okay. Well, Naaman, in case you're unfamiliar or forgot some parts, but Naaman was a commander of an army, so he was a very important person in his nation. And one day he got leprosy. And in case you don't know, leprosy is like an illness that makes like white spots all over your body, and it's really uncomfortable. And at the time, they really didn't know how to cure it. They would like send people outside of the town like to get rid of it because it was very difficult to handle and it was contagious. This was even worse because Naaman had such a high position and it was kind of hard for his job and everything. So he was desperate to get better, and a servant girl who worked for him came up and said, you should see the prophet Elisha. And so that's what he did. So he went to the prophet Elisha, and he said, can you heal me of leprosy? And Elisha said, I, can, I can't heal you, but God can heal you. And he says that if you go into the Jordan River and dip seven times, that you'll be healed. So Elisha went, or Naaman, <laughs> went to the Jordan River, and he went and started to dip. But the thing about the Jordan River, in case you don't know, is that it's a really dirty river, and it's not some place you want to be casually dipping in. But he was really desperate to get healed. So he dipped a couple times, and nothing happened. He might have started to become skeptical after like five or six times of dipping because nothing had changed, and God said that he would heal him. But Naaman really wanted to be healed, so he followed the instructions and kept dipping in the river. So that's what he did, and after the seventh time, he dipped in the water, and he came back up, and it was a miracle. All his leprosy was gone. He was completely healed. He was so happy. He looked at his skin, and it was clean, and he went to Elisha and said, thank you, thank you so much for healing me. And Elisha said, I didn't heal you. It was God who healed you. And Naaman was like, take all these gifts, take all these gifts. I'm so happy, thank you. But Elisha said, no, 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 I can't take any of this. God healed you. It wasn't me. So Naaman was like, all right, praise God, and went about his way. So there was a man who worked for Elisha, and his name was Gehazi. And he saw that Naaman was healed and was offering all these gifts to Elisha. And he saw that Elisha turned it away. But Gehazi wanted to get the gifts. So he went after Naaman and lied and said that Elisha had some visitors over, and he was asking for some silver and some clothes for those gift, uh, visitors. So Naaman, who was healed, was really happy, and he was like, okay, okay, sure, here's the gifts, or here's the stuff that he needs. And so Gehazi came and went and went back to his place and left the stuff at his house because he lied, and then he went to Elisha, and then Elisha asked, why did you go after Naaman? And he said, I didn't go after Naaman, and he's like, yes, you did go after Naaman. God told me you went after Naaman. You weren't supposed to go because God gave instructions that you weren't supposed to take anything from him. You weren't supposed to take the gifts because God healed him. So Gehazi didn't follow God's instructions. So the result was that God cursed him and he got Naaman's leprosy. And he would have it all over his body and it was almost instantaneous. And it would follow his family forever. 
Now, with this story, you have Naaman, who followed God's instructions and dipped all the times he said and was healed. He got the blessings. But Gehazi didn't follow God's instructions, and he got the consequences of his actions. God gives us instructions because he only wants what's best for us. So when God gives us instructions, we need to follow them properly. So I hope as you guys go throughout your week, you remember to follow God's instructions. Would either of you like to pray? No? All right, I can pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for guarding and protecting us. And please help us to follow your instructions. And let us have a good day today. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. We're seeking to revive this new feature. Well, we've had it before, Ministry in Action, as we focus on our upcoming Health Ministry Day. And I have with us our two elders, and they have been, in, been, been an integrate part of this. I'm seeing Knut coming. Uh, he may be able to provide uh, some information. Let me start, start with you, Elder Nick. Could you just share uh, with us uh, two minutes or less as to what are some of the objectives we have for our health, health fair? Why, why are we doing this? Is it that we just want to have a Sunday where we can just hang out together? Why are we doing this? Thank you, Pastor. I, I noticed that stayed in two minutes or less. I, I get you. All right, good morning, church. I'm so glad to share this with you. I'm so excited about this. Um, listen, as elders and leaders of this church and ministry leaders, we sat down a few years back and said, if this church was not here tomorrow, would the community care? Would they notice? And the reality is, they probably wouldn't know until a few years ago we got involved in the pandemic relief and we started helping the community. And I know so many of you here and online got involved and it filled your heart and we were able to touch this community for Jesus. So we said, what can we do next? Yeah. And we say, listen, as Seventh-day Adventists, we've got this health message, right? People are studying us all over the world, but are we sharing it with our community? So we've decided that we're going to go out to the plantation community and we're going to bring the health fair and we're going to highlight New Start. And I don't know a lot about New Start, but you're going to hear about it in a little while. I understand nutrition rest, but it's not going to be just a health fair. We don't just want the health boost. We are looking for an opportunity, Pastor, yes. to develop relationships. We want to have an event where people are walking through, strolling through, learning about the health event, but their kids are going to be having fun. We're going to have bounce houses and face painting, climbing walls. We're hoping to have live music there. So if you have any great musicians that can come out, we so, want you. We need you. So it's our way of seeking to connect with community, yes. being in community. Now, now uh, Elder Mozart, you've been uh, very involved in terms of the interaction with the city. Could you just share as to the, the, the sort of feedback you're getting uh, the sort of cooperation you're getting as you're, you're interacting with the city. Of course, we need permits and stuff like that. Could you just give us uh, a quick sure, feedback on that? Sure, sure. Um, the city has been very cooperative because they want something like this to come to their city. They yeah. want their, their residents to, you know, to participate in something like this and hear what other churches are doing to connect with the community. So the city officials, they've been very cooperative with our, our permit request and uh, I've been speaking to the police department so we, so we can have extra presence there on that day. Um, the council members, are, we're engaging them to make sure that they will show up so that they could be there to listen to the residents if they have any questions. And one of our, our main um, council member, uh, Nick Sordo, that I've been speaking to, he's also engaging. He's trying to get our, our state representative who represents this area in yeah. Tallahassee to also be present on yeah. that day. So the city is all in. We need you guys to be all in, so yes. please register yes. and volunteer on that day because yes. we're going to need about 100 volunteers on that day. All right, and that's where I want to come to Knut, as you could share to, uh, with us as to how many boots or hands we need on the ground right now <laughs> and uh, what plans are we making to ensure that we're getting folks. How can I get involved if I want to get involved as a member? Okay, thank you so much, Pastor. Good question. As you can see, folks, I'm excited about this. This is not a health ministry event. Let me just say, emphasize that. It's not a health ministry event. It's a church-wide event. We want all hands on deck, okay? 
we're talking about our parents shift and we're thinking love God, love others, make disciples. This is our opportunity, Amen. folks. Amen. Let's all get out there and meet people. Nick mentioned about our new start, right? Yes. We're going to be highlighting our theme is living your best life. And we want the community to get excited about living their best life. We're going to have um, booths. We're going to have um, all eight laws of health displayed. Yes. And we're going to have people demonstrate and tell you about it. You know, Nick mentioned some of the other things. Kids zone, face paintings. We're going to give out backpacks. And here's a challenge for you folks. We are planning on giving out 75 backpacks to the first 75 kids that come through. Yes. We're going to challenge you. So everybody can get involved. Each of you, donate a backpack, write a note to that anonymous kid, and tell them how excited you're about the new school year that's coming up, okay. and how that we at Plantation Seventh-day Adventists are going right. to be praying for them. All right, Cindy, you're pretty excited. Let me just ask you two questions, Canute, <laughs> as we pray. Uh, number one, how many persons are we looking for right now? Could you give us a number? Any of you guys can give us a number? What's the number? Where? What's the, the goal? As to volunteers, how many persons we're shooting we, for? We need a hundred volunteers. Hundred volunteers at minimum. At minimum, hundred volunteers okay. to man the booth so that no one person is standing at a booth right. all day long. It goes from ten till four. Yes. So we need to be able to rotate the volunteers. Okay. I want to say that you will be trained. All right. Okay. July 9th. This is really important. We're not going to ask you to go do something, and you're going to be lost there. Yes. On July 9th and on July 23rd, we will be do two training lunches where you'll sit down, you'll learn all about New Start, and you will be taught exactly. What and to we're do. signing up folks right now, right? Right now in the lobby. Or right now in the lobby. If you scan that QR code, it'll take you to a form, and you'll fill yes. it out, and then you'll be reached out to again on July 9th, right. July 23rd. We'll be doing the training. All right. And the last question I have is self-interest. Can I bring my drone? That's fine. I can take my drone. Can you can you take, take your drone. Your drone. Yeah, I can take pictures. <laughs> then drone. yes, we want your drone there. And actually, okay. don't forget to sign up. All right, I will. One I last will. thing, guys, and this is something the uh, one of the finance team members asked me to share. This. Yes. This isn't free. Okay. And I'm sorry that we have to do this part, but it's costing us about twenty thousand dollars to put this together. Yes. So, in addition to helping us with backpacks, we're asking that if it's on your heart. If you're willing to make a donation to this particular event, yes, we want this to be the best event that the city of Plantation has ever seen. And the truth is, it takes time, yes, and it takes resources. So if Amen. you can, if you can help out in that way as well, Amen. We let's let's say a prayer together. Father God, we thank you so much for placing this on the hearts of of the leaders here. It is our desire to to be of good, to be your hands and feet in the community plantation. May you bless these plans, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, fellas. Thank you so much. Happy Sabbath Church. It's time to worship God with our gifts. Hosea 8 and verse 7. For they have sown the, the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. This law of sowing and reaping as established in Hosea chapter 8 applies to all areas of life. For example, you plant one mango seed, and when you bears, you reap many mangoes. Every act is a seed planted in our character that will multiply in favor of the rewards of heaven or eternal death. Little sins have big consequences, and small acts of kindness have great rewards. As we give of ourselves, to the Lord, let us give, let our gifts come from a heart of gratitude and love and watch the Lord multiply his goodness to us. Bring all your tithes, offering and gifts into the storehouse of the Lord and prove him today.
the many ways of giving and different ways of giving on the screen let us pray Dear father and god we thank you for the gift of life we thank you for health and strength we thank you for your sabbath thank you that we could come here and worship unmolested and father god thank you for continue to provide for us and as you provide for us that we can take those blessings and bless others i pray over your offering and your tithes today and may go forth to finish your god's will this we pray with thanksgiving in jesus name Sabbath again, church. I invite you to stand as we continue our worship. You know, um, I was reading something that mentions how the top um, disorder uh, in the world, worldwide, is anxiety. Anxiety disorders um, here in the United States affect at least almost 20 million people. And then when you talk about worldwide, a over a billion people are affected by anxiety and of course you give a medication and do all these other things that help but the Bible believe it or not has a cure for anxiety and it's found in Matthew down in chapter 6 verses 25 to 34 now if you read it it tells us for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat, what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. And then verse 26, which that's my birth verse, says to look at the birds of the air. And when you think about it, look at nature. The birds aren't even worried about being provided for. Why is it that we who are made in his image worry so much when we are made in the image of the provider we're made in the image of Jireh himself and I want you guys if you are going through anxiety and a lot of times when you do and I've been there you look at yourself in the mirror you don't like what you see but I want you to look at yourselves in the mirror and understand that what's looking back is the image of God himself he's made it in you that's why he said don't make any other images of him because he's already made it in us he's Jaira and whatever you're going through whatever you need whatever you need to be provided today call on him because he's Jaira I just invite you to sing along with us today I'll never be more love than I am right now Wasn't holding you up So there's nothing I can do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more love than I am right now oh. Going through a storm but I won't go down I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out You would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now Come on all over this place, say Jaira, say You are Jaira, you are enough to be provided for singing with a singer. Jaira, you are enough. And I will be, and I will be content. And 
every, in every circumstance. Cause you are Shira, you are enough. It's forever enough, always enough, always more than enough. Yeah, forever enough, always enough, always more than enough. to forget how I feel right now on the mountaintop I can see so clear what it's all about stay by my side when the sun goes down don't want to forget how I feel right now Shira, Shira, you are in I'm already enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm already chosen. I know who I am. Yeah. I know what you've spoken. I'm already in love. More than I can imagine. God is enough. Come on, let's sing that again. Let's sing that again. Sing, sing. I'm already in love. you so much church I can't express it enough he loved you so much he sent his one and only son to die knowing that come on knowing that we would turn our backs on him I'm, I'm a little choked up right now because I'm one of those people I turn my back on you father but thank you for dying for me anyway you repent Lord thank you God Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Let's worship. Let's worship. If 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. When you think of what God has done for you and continue to do for you, you can't just but praise him, Dane, and said, say, he's more than enough. His love is more than enough. And that leads right to the text that I was inspired to read this morning before prayer. And the text is taken from Psalms chapter 63 division, the, the 63rd division of Psalm, uh, verses 3 to 5. And it reads, Listen to this carefully. Because your love is better than life. Yeah. Let me repeat that. Because your love is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied. I'm going to repeat that. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joy and life. Because your love is better than life. Now, our praise leader talked about folks who are anxious, folks who are lonely. There are many of us with needs that we just can't understand how God's going to satisfy those needs. Some of us are mourning. Some of us are just wondering what's going to happen to our children. And we are anxious and stressed. I want to tell you that God loves covers all of that. And it satisfies. I want to tell you that God's love doesn't just take the edge off of what you're feeling this morning. God love is not just some little bit of crumbs or a thing to sort of, you know, appetizer. God's love is like a feast when you're hungry. It fully satisfies. So I want to encourage you this morning. If there's something on your heart right now that's burdening you, if there is, you're lonely, you're anxious, or you're just praying for someone, or there's something burdening, Please come forward. Bring your cards. If you just want to praise God for what He's done, bring your cards. We place it in the open Bible or come with just the prayer in your heart. And let us seek God as we realize that His love satisfies us fully. Come, let us pray. Come forward. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and some with tired lips, some with burdened hearts, some filled with joy, praise God, some with excitement, but some barely, barely making it in here. But nonetheless, we are here and we have come to worship you. So as we come to worship you now, Lord, we just want to recognize how great you are. We want to recognize how satisfying you are, how fulfilling you are, and that how you are that great provider, how you are that great sustainer, how you are the great encourager, Lord. We just want to recognize that and praise you right now. There, Father, I want to thank you for the song selection from the praise team. And I can't get that line out of my head because many times we search for other ways to solve our problems. Many times we search for other things to fill us up. Many times we, we search for, for things that are, are, are good on the surface but does not necessarily include you. But this morning the songwriter reminds us that you are more than enough. 
your love is more than enough we need nothing else Lord so we come before you and we say take us as we are and we pour our hearts out to you and say Lord forgive us for where we have gone wrong forgive us for where we had we have lacked faith in you and Lord give us the faith as small as a mustard seed that we need to trust in your words to trust in you to know that your love is more than enough dear father as we come before you right now there is someone on their knees may they may be in their living room on their couch in their bed on in the car driving now listening to my voice and they are anxious they're anxious for a multitude of things but they may be just one main thing on their heart they may be anxious because they're not quite sure how they're going to make that rent payment that has just gone up over 800 900 dollars um, and the lease is coming due now and they're trying to figure out how are they going to make it and financially they're seeing things going in the other direction than it should and they're saying lord what am i going to do how can i do this lord help them to realize that you are more than enough and you have the cattle on a thousand hills and you can provide for them as you did yesterday you will do it for them today and tomorrow their father there's someone who's anxious and, and, and feeling like they don't know what to do because their child is going the wrong path. Their child has totally rejected you and they're going with friends and in activities and things that are just not in line and literally things that could take their lives and they're pleading out to you and they have been pleading out to you and they're saying, Lord, where are you in this process? Can you save my child? Lord, help them to know that your love covers a multitude of sin. And where they can't go, their prayers can reach. And that your angels are there protecting and saving our children. Help them to realize that you're still in the saving business. Their father, there are many right now who are concerned about their marriage and their relationships. And they are thinking that man it's going to work out it's going to work out and day after day they're seeing that it's just not working out it's actually definitely dead and nothing is happening and it's not going to work but their father helped them to realize that if they humble themselves before you if they seek your face if they turn lord you will change you will repent and they repent you will change the circumstances you will turn things around and turn things that were upside down and put it right side up you will take things that are dead like dry bones and bring it back to life help them to know that lord you're more than enough and their father i could pray on and on but there are some who are mourning the loss of loved ones <laughs> and it's been weeks it's been months it's been years but that empty feeling is just there still that loneliness is is thicker than anything else you can cut it with a knife and they're wondering uh, can i see through this the darkness is too great should i just take my life should i just give up lord i pray that you will help them to realize that you still love them and you're right there with them and you're carrying them through and that there is light behind the clouds and that they will seek you and they will find you Lord help them to sense your love right now thank you for answering these prayers Lord and Lord finally I'm gonna pray for the one who has the message today cover him Lord you have laid a message on his heart for his church for his church for his 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 own this is he's coming home to give us a message coming from you Lord I pray that you will be with CJ today and allow this man who is dedicated to you to speak for you today speak help you to speak through him and his words will touch your our hearts this is my prayer in Jesus precious name Amen. Shine.
Sabbath will be a very special, extra special day in the life of our church as our own Pastor Jennifer Hernandez will be commissioned. Amen. As we'll seek to affirm her ministry, the folks will be coming down from, uh, not Jerusalem, from uh, Orlando uh, to be here as we affirm her ministry. We thank God for what he's been doing with her and her family. And so next Sabbath, we'll get a chance to affirm what we believe God has already affirmed. Amen. Thank God that we have, as was indicated in the prayer, our, our hometown boy, C.J. Cousins. Amen. Pastor Cousins has come by here to share the word. He doesn't need much in terms of introduction, but I thank God for his willingness to come and share the word. Uh, currently, Pastor uh, CJ serves our church in the Potomac Conference there uh, with a very good friend of mine, Paul Graham. And he also is the senior pastor at the Vienna SDA Church in Northern uh, Virginia. Thank you so much, Pastor CJ, for consenting to come and share the word. I pray for the same spirit who was with you in preparation will be with you now in your presentation. Amen. Praise the Lord, family. Oh, come on, we can do a little bit better than that. We just did that a moment ago in song. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to be back home. It really, really is. I'm excited to be here with you. Some of you are familiar with who I may be, and then some of you are like, who is this man that just got up there, dark chocolate, talking about this is his home? Well, amen, this is my home. As a matter of fact, I left here when I was, uh, it was 2006. Okay, so if you've come after that, then you probably have no idea who this guy is, um, but I'm very happy to be here. And I, when, I come, when I came here and just re greeting everybody and all the hugs and I was just looking around and I was saying, wow, look what God has done. Really, I mean, just to see where things were and to be a part of that story and then to see where you guys are now is just amazing. And so you guys really ought to just be proud of what God is doing here, but God's work is not done, amen? Oh, he's got greater in store. Today I wanna invite you to go to your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to be in 13, but I want us to start first, if we can, in chapter 12. I want to thank uh, the invitation to come and be here with you guys, a special weekend for me and my family. Uh, some of you that may be lingering a little bit more uh, to have a school, and of course, second service, you will see some of them. Um, and I also want to just thank uh, Pastor Rose, I want to thank you and your ministry and inviting me to come, and, uh, and James. Um, I, I, I have to say... I'm currently the interim pastor. I, I, I've been the associate pastor over younger generations. I'm essentially a glorified youth pastor. I have also a school that I serve, um, and our senior pastor retired, and therefore I'm the one holding down the fort with an amazing team there at the Vienna Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, they're in a search for a senior pastor, so that, that, you know, that could possibly be a reality, but I'm just serving the Lord and being willing to do whatever he calls me to do. All right, well, I want to invite you now. You didn't come to hear me talk about me. You came to hear and see Jesus. Amen? I want to invite us just to bow our heads one more time as we get ready to go into his word. I want to invite you now. Father in heaven, we want you to be on display right now. We really, really want you and your fame to go before us right now. And so I'm asking right now that you would remove the speaker and that you'd please allow yourself to be manifested among us. Your character of love clearly revealed to everyone here vividly through the text, especially as revealed in Jesus, him crucified and risen for us. And then Holy Spirit, would you then implant that same love deeply inside of our souls. 
that it would have outward impacts to everybody in our spheres of influence, and they would know by hanging with us what it's like to hang out with Jesus. So right now, please be in our midst and do what you have intended to do in this moment and in this hour. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen and amen. I loved watching her as she did her ministry leading and serving, serving our children in church, and she was the director of the Adventurer's Ministry. I know we have a very uh, active and beautiful ministry here when it comes to our children. And she was serving just brilliantly, very organized, very talented, very gifted. Well, for the life of me, I just could not understand why it was that she just could not seem to get along with others. She just could not seem to have a good relationship with people. As a matter of fact, she would, when the parents particularly, um, when the parents would want to reach out to her to get some information regarding the adventure and ministry, she would just refer them to the manual. She put it together. It was very organized, and she said, that's what it's for. Go check the manual. Don't bother me with that. I already put that inside the manual for you. And they just wanted to talk to the one that was leading and serving their children, and so she had conflict with the parents. Well, as a pastor, this is me now as a rookie pastor at the time, and I'm hearing a little bit of the backstory that she had had a little bit of a pattern she had had this same type of a pattern when she was at previous churches, maybe about two, three churches prior. And one day she's meeting with us as a, as a pastoral staff, and she basically just comes right out with it. She says, look, listen, I just want to come here. I just want to do my task, do my ministry, serve the children. I don't want to have to deal with negotiating, nurturing, or managing any relationships, and I just want to go home. Essentially what she was saying is, she's saying, I just want to come here and focus on the task, than on the people. And maybe you've experienced this type of situation. Maybe you've actually been that type of person. Just say amen. And if you can't, just say ouch. And uh, maybe this is you today. I don't know. I'm sure at some point in all of our lives, it's been any one of us here. Or maybe it's even worse. Maybe it's not only that you've had difficulty in managing and nurturing relationships, and you may be very gifted. But it could also be that you also have had maybe a kind of my gift is better than yours kind of a spirit, or maybe you've had the kind of a spirit that says, you know, this is kind of like a competition, you know, my gifts, and so I should kind of outdo your gifts, and so therefore mine should get more shine, mine should get more press. Maybe that's been you, and this is the very same kind of spirit that creates a kind of an atmosphere of division and woundedness in churches. And this is the same kind of pastoral concern that Paul brings to the text here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you're gonna notice that he has one kind of complete thought, okay? Uh, often when I was growing up, maybe you've had this experience as well, you're reading chapters and so you read the chapters and you say to yourself, well listen, he's kind of completing one thought at the end of chapter 12 and he's going to move into another subject another thought in chapter 13 and he's going to move into another one in chapter 14 what you're going to notice here is that paul has one complete thought he's actually moving through the same thought from chapters 12 to 14. there were no chapter divisions there were no punctuations in the original greek text we kind of put that historically in the christian church for ease of read and reference but what is happening here is he's got one main subject for three chapters, and it's spiritual gifts. It's spiritual gifts. I hope you have your Bibles open, printed, or electronic, either way is fine, but it's spiritual gifts. Now, in chapter 12, you know, I'm kind of familiar with, with, with the book of Corinthians, you know, I mean, in chapter 12, you would think that that spiritual gifts is the main subject of just chapter 12, yes? Until I discovered that there was a word that keeps coming up over and over and over again in chapter 12. And that's the word one, one, one. And you begin to discover that actually his primary concern is actually oneness, unity, and equality in the body of Christ. And it's through spiritual gifts that he's now going to apply this primary pastoral concern. Now, if you're at all familiar with the story of the church in Corinth in Greece, you'll understand that they were a messed up church. I mean, they were jacked up. I mean, they had all kinds of issues, incest, sexual immorality. They had issues of kind of uh, 
selfishness and, and self-righteousness in many ways manifesting. And uh, they had division on a variety of things. We're going to focus in on one of those issues right now when it comes to division. And Paul says, I need to focus right now in chapters 12, what we would call chapters 12 to 14. I need to focus on this particular issue that's causing division and its spiritual gifts and how we appropriate and use our spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. And in chapter 12, what he's essentially doing, and I know we had a powerful message last Sabbath, right? That kind of went through chapter 12, yes? Well, I want to just briefly just kind of sum up there what he's saying in chapter 12. He's talking about spiritual gifts in the context of unity and oneness in the body of Christ. I mean, this is what Jesus prayed for, right, Jack? This is what Jesus prayed for in John 17, that we would be what? That we would be one, right? That we would be unified, yes? And so, he, so what he's doing is he's laying this out, and he's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit is the source of your spiritual gifts, and the one that's primarily the one working through all of your spiritual gifts, amen? But then he moves on, and he says, now, you are all uniquely gifted, yet one body. You're all uniquely gifted, but you're one body. And therefore, he moves on to his third thought. And that is in chapter 12. He moves on to his third thought. And what he basically says is, he says, now, in order for you to preserve that oneness, you need to care for one another because you need each other. You need to care for one another because you actually need each other. And now I'm going to say this parenthetically. This is why in Hebrews, the Spirit also inspires that we are to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? It's not an arbitrary kind of command, like show up. No, it's you need, does your finger need your arm? Yes, does, it, does your head need your neck? It can't function because you're one, you see that? You're one body, and he's trying to say, listen, in Christ, spiritually, there's a definite reality that this is what you are. And if my finger gets detached, God forbid, from my body, guess what's going to happen to my finger? Well, it's going to die. Well, what's going to happen to us when we get disconnected, whether in person or virtually, amen? What happens when we disconnect from one another? Guess what happens to us? Have you ever felt the drift? How about in this pandemic? So here's what he's doing now. We're going to move now to verse 31. He ends chapter 12, well, what we would call chapter 12 because he wasn't ending a thought. He's actually introducing a new thought. He says, listen, now I've just talked to you about oneness. That's, that's important for us in the body of Christ, in the church, yes? But what he's saying is now, is that, but I have to give you a more or a most excellent way to preserve your oneness. I have to show you what the main, somebody say main thing. I need to show you what's the current running through not only the body of Christ, really the entirety of Scripture, according to Jesus in Matthew 22. But I need to show you what the primary, the meat, really is. Now, some people, what we're going to talk about here, don't think it's the meat, but actually it is. And so come with me now to verse number 1 of chapter 13. I know we have uh, verse 31 of chapter 12. Let's read that really quickly, actually. It says in the New King James Version, it says, But I earnestly desired the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Some translations will say a most or the most excellent way. This influences, this, this informs the title of the message today, The Excellent Way. The Excellent Way. Because this is a church, as I've walked in today, that's full of gifted, talented people serving in a variety of different areas of ministry. And sometimes, though that is excellent, though that is good, it may not be the real thing that God is after among us. Merely serving is good, but he wants something deeper that you got to get to the root of, right? So let's go now and dive into it, because here's the question we're probing today, and you may have asked this question of yourself. What is the best way? What is the best way? For us to preserve our oneness while serving with a variety of spiritual gifts. What is the best way? Listen, to, for us to preserve our oneness while serving with a variety of spiritual gifts. Come with me. 
Let's take the journey now and see what the Holy Spirit wants to instruct our hearts with as we go into the text. Are you there? All right, all right. Are you there online in the chat? Go ahead and put something in the chat. Say, I'm there. Here's the Bible. It's what it says. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, if I speak with the tongues of men, that's inclusive of women, of course, that's people. If I speak with the tongues of men or, the, or, or human beings and of angels, but do not have what? Come on and talk to me today. But do not have what? Love. I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And for effect, I would have probably had the drummer go ahead and just start banging on those cymbals for me, right? He says, listen, in verse 2, if I have, listen, now this is relevant to us, is it? If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing, nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, that's important, is it not? I think we have a ministry in Miami still, yes? And even if I surrender, listen, if I surrender my body, to be burned. That's like being burned at the stake. That's being a martyr. But do not have love, it profits me nothing. Dane, zero. Zilch. That was pointless. That effort, meaningless. And why is he talking about the gift of prophecy and speaking in tongues and knowledge and the gift and, and, and all these various gifts is because he's still in chapter 13 on the same subject. He's still talking about spiritual gifts. He's introducing a more excellent way, but the main concern is still spiritual gifts. Are you hearing this? And so he's saying now in the context of your spiritual gifts, he says, listen, if you don't have love, then it's pointless. In other words, what he's saying here is, he's saying, listen, the more excellent way, the more excellent way of love preserves our oneness while serving with a variety of spiritual gifts because serving without love is meaningless. Serving without love is meaningless. You've got talented people right now serving, but without love, it's nothing. It's meaningless. It's empty. Can I talk real talk real quick? It's like casual sex. It's like performing the mere act that God actually intended to be beautiful and pleasurable and holy. It was there in the garden before sin. He intended it between a husband and wife, right? In a, in a lifelong a commitment of faithful love, that brings a sense of security to the relationship. It's not going anywhere. They say in science that children actually know, they have a sense of, as to whether or not the, either one of the spouses is, tends to be the husband because they're inside the, the womb, uh, or I shouldn't even say, they're not the husband if you're shacking up, it tends to be the other partner. They tend to know whether or not that person is actually in a committed, listen, a committed relationship, marriage essentially, a covenant, yes? How do they know that? Because they can sense the anxiety biologically of the mother as to whether or not this person can just back out. So, so, so there's a reason that God established marriage. Now, I know it's been jacked up and redefined, all kind of stuff by the enemy, but what God intended was beautiful, was holy, was pleasurable. And he loves sex. Did you hear that? We need to reclaim sex and talking about sex in our home and in the church. We need to take it back from the world and actually show them the beautiful thing because guess what? They're actually getting a subpar experience. I'm going to say that again. They're actually getting a subpar experience. Why? Because it's not what God originally intended. That was actually supposed to reflect the intimacy and oneness of the Godhead. Therefore, what we're getting does not really deliver. 
The deception is through, you know, media and all kind of stuff that's out there that people can click on and see and go to sites. Hello, nobody in here is going to any of those sites. What's happening is the enemy likes to deceive us like the fruit. He likes to deceive us that something is better than it actually is. But what God does is he actually shows you the thing and it's all of its beauty. And when you actually taste it, it's far better than what you saw. That's the deception. So guess what? If you're engaged in that kind of futile, mere act, some people say, oh, it was just sex. Then listen, that's pointless. It's meaningless. You're getting a subpar experience that actually leads to self-destruction. It does not deliver. And this is kind of what Jesus is kind of getting at. If you want to go there with me, you can if you want, if you have your Bibles. But I'm just going to go ahead and read it myself. This is kind of what Jesus is getting at. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 to 23. Many of us are familiar with this text. We've heard it said in a lot of evangelistic preaching. Amen? And Jesus is saying, he says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, listen, here's the gifts. Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, listen, cast out what? Demons, exorcisms, and in your name perform many miracles. And then Jesus now, gentle Jesus, with children on his lap, yes? Jesus says, I will declare to you in that day, depart. I never, what? Oh, don't miss that. That's his point. I never knew you. The actual word there is, is yada in the Hebrew or gnosko in the Greek. It means an intimate relational knowledge. Not that you just knew information about Jesus or 28 beliefs. They point you somewhere. Intimacy with God through Jesus Christ. And so he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God's law is a reflection of his character of love. What he's saying is, you who practice lovelessness, you've expelled love from the heart. You're not receptive to the wooings of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you can't be in, in harmony with the transcript of my character of other-centered love. It's not arbitrary on the part of God. We pulled the plug. And so he just basically tells you what you want to hear, what, what you actually have been demonstrating. Depart. We're not in intimacy of relationship. You're not going to be happy here. Listen, Jesus is clearly saying that we can be spiritually gifted to do all manner of works in his name. And by the way, name also is a revelation of character, his character of love. But if you do not have the intimacy of relationship with him, that results in the love of the Father abiding in the heart through the Holy Spirit, then you'll find yourself lost. He's not sugarcoating it. That's the reality. It's pointless, it's, it's futile, it's vain, it's empty, it's meaningless. Instead, here it is. Jesus is urgently calling you. Urgently calling you into the experience of loving others well. Loving others well as a result of loving God well. But listen, the only way that you can be moved to love God well is that you first need to see regularly, intentionally, how he has loved you well through Jesus Christ. You can't will yourself into loving others well. You can't effort your way into loving God well. No, family, what you got to do is you've got to first daily come to the scriptures and allow in full, vivid display God's character of love to be revealed to you daily. Now, I'm not just talking about a casual reading. I'm talking about intentionally. I'm reading the Bible, and I'm looking specifically, my primary focus, how has God's love been revealed to me in the text today? Look for it. It's everywhere. And it'll always lead you to the reality that God is love. That's the premise. One preacher just said recently, Ty Gibson, that is my fundamental belief. God is love. And every other belief is going to flow from that premise. God is love. 
You want to, especially as you're there in the Bible, you want to particularly look for his love on full display in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because there it is most vividly revealed. And then from there, you want to just add this into your daily rhythm. From there, you want to ask the Holy Spirit, who Paul says in Romans 5, 5, pours the love of God into our hearts. That's actually how the law of love is written on the heart. It's through the Holy Spirit, okay? So just add to your prayer. It's real simple. Add to your prayer life every day when you go to the cross and you're talking to God. You want to also say, Holy Spirit, fill me with your love today. I can't do this on my own. I can't love well. I want to. But God, do something in my heart. Now, we're talking about love, and Paul knows that love is, that word just gets thrown around. There's a variety of ways that people describe it, and it's often misunderstood. So Paul now, listen, begins to describe what love looks like, beginning in verse number four. Go with me there. Here's what he says. Love is what? Patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not selfish. It's not provoked. One translation will say it's not easily provoked. In our current discord in this nation, which is tragic, not easily provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. I'm reading from the, new, the, N the NASB. Verse 6, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, does not rejoice in unrighteousness. We need to be reminded of that uh, this week. I'm just going gonna, gonna to be, behave myself. But, but rejoices with the truth, rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Why is Paul writing this? Why is he unpacking what love looks like, the attributes of love? I believe it's for two reasons. Number one. This is because this is what's lacking in the experience of the Corinthian believers. You're lacking in patience, right? You're lacking in kindness. You're lacking in these things. This is what love is, okay? But here's, and watch this. Please don't miss. This is powerful. Here is really the heart of what he's getting at. The second and primary reason I believe that he's describing these things is because these are the very attributes of God's character of love. Therefore, when you come back to the text, you can just insert God's name there because 1 John 4, 8, uh, and 16 tells us that God is love. He sums up everything about God's character in one word. And so here's what it actually says if you want to actually look at what he's getting at. God is patient. God is kind and is not jealous in the evil sense because he is a, a husband that if you cheat on him, he's going to get jealous. But uh, does not brag. God does not brag. He's not arrogant. He's not act, he doesn't act unbecomingly. It, it, he doesn't seek his own. He's not easily provoked. He does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Are, are, are you hearing that? This is the attributes of God's character of love, and here's the beautiful thing. God, have you ever, let me just say this really quickly. Everybody just do something really quick for me. Take your finger. Just hold it up like this. I want you to take that finger and just put it right here on your side by your rib and just wiggle it a little bit. Does that tickle? How's that working for you? No, it doesn't. But if your neighbor were to do the exact same thing, what would happen? What sensation would you get, right? It, would tickle. it takes another person to actually experience that sensation. Therefore, God within his own nature from eternity past had to exist in order for him logically to be love. Love is essentially relational. It's community. It's friendship, it's other-centeredness. God within his own nature has to be more than one. In order to experience love, in order for that text to be true, it's like a tickle. And so what he's saying is the interworkings of the Godhead, the, their ways, is the excellent way of love that we're to be replicating. That's supposed to be manifested in our own lives and in our marriages and in our homes and in our church and bleed over into the community. And this is because, this is because what we're learning here, what we're discovering here is that the excellent way of love preserves our oneness while serving with a variety of spiritual gifts because it reflects the way of the Godhead or Trinity. It reflects the way of the Godhead or Trinity. You know, I'm a, I'm a parent now, and I think every parent, especially those parents that went through the pandemic, needs a trophy 
needs an honorary medal from the government, something. I'm also proudly the parent of two children on the spectrum for autism. And I want to tell you, your children replicate what they see in mom and dad, for better or for worse. The way mom and dad treat one another, the way mom and dad interact with them, that's exactly what they start to replicate and duplicate. The way that I love to and my wife loves to hug each other and hug them and tickle them, guess what they do? They hug and they tickle one another exactly the same way. My son is a little bit too rough, but that's kind of like his daddy. We love really, really strong. Pray for us. And then there is uh, my daughter now, what she's doing, the way we will talk to both of them and say, hey, no, 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 don't climb there. Get down from over there. Don't put that in your mouth. Well, guess what my daughter is starting to do with my son? And he's older. She'll say, no, 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 Tommy, no, no, no. Take that out of your mouth. Get your bite to it. No, 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 don't do that. Just like us. Because your children replicate your character, your ways. They inherit things from us, for better or for worse. It's the same thing with our replicating the Godhead. When we see how they interact with each other through Scripture, when we see particularly how they have been manifested in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that holy history. Here is what the writer says John, in John chapter 4, verse 7 and 16, he says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Then in verse 16, he says, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in, in him or her. In other words, when the church individually or collectively abides in the love of God and therefore we love one another, we are literally experiencing what Kim Allen Johnson, author Kim Allen Johnson, describes or calls in his book, The Team, Trinity Life. Trinity Life. Trinity Life. The life of the Trinity has always been a ceaseless ebb and flow of faithful love since eternity past. Now, I want you to be astonished as we can now consider what John says in the beginning of that same book, John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, as he's talking about the eternal life of love found in the Trinity or the Godhead, which he witnessed manifest in the life of Jesus, and that we've been invited into that same fellowship of love in the Godhead. Listen to what he says. He says in verse number 3 of 1 John, he says, what we have seen, he's reporting, him and the disciples, he's reporting what he and the disciples have experienced. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim, we declare to you also that you too may have, listen, fellowship with us, with the disciples, with the church, right, with, with, the, with the apostles. But listen, and indeed, listen, he takes it a step further, indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If you were to unpack that even further, it is inclusive of the Holy Spirit. You have fellowship, union, oneness with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus in his prayer in the last few chapters there before the cross, John chapters 14 to 17. One of the things he'll talk about is that the, he and the Father will come to you and make their home abide with and in you through the Holy Spirit. You have the fullness of divine access and presence through the relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, to love is not something that you can produce. It has to come through being in fellowship with the Godhead, learning their ways, seeing how they move. Because if we do that, then we too can be one with each other. You see, the each member of the Godhead took on different roles at different times throughout the story of Scripture as it unfolds. Jesus, particularly in his incarnation, temporarily humbled himself and just came as a human being to the point of the cross, right? And so they take on roles. The Holy Spirit right now comes and continues that. I got it. I got the baton. He dwells in us and takes the work of Christ and brings it home to our hearts and in our lives, yes? And so what's happening here is, is that the church is supposed to be replicating that even though we have gifts that we use for maybe functioning for different periods of time, yes? We are to replicate them. It's the most excellent way. They are one and they are equal, therefore we are one and we are equal even though we might function differently. 
willingly taking on roles for the sake of mission. But there's one more and final thing I just want to share with you before we close and I take my seat. Because love is foundationally relational. You cannot experience what church really truly is like without love. You can't merely come and say, I'm just going to do my job and go home. You've been called into a fellowship. You've been called into a family, and this is a family. You've been called to love one another. And so here's what he's going to tell us now about how long this type of love will last. How long will it last, Paul? Well, he says in verse number eight, he says, love never fails. Ah, thank you, Jesus. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. Uh-oh. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, in other words, when God comes, his revelation, even in Christ at his second coming, when we finally now are experiencing more fully because eternal life begins now when you say yes to Jesus, but when more fully at the second coming, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, when I was immature, when I was spiritually immature and infantile, I used to speak like a child, right? Think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, however, I did away with childish things. We need to grow up, he's basically saying. We need to mature. For now we see, Paul is saying, Paul is saying, now we, including himself, sees in a mirror dimly. He's the anointed prophet, apostle, Paul. I see dimly right now, but then face to face. How many of you want to see him one day face to face? His face of love is countenance towards you. You get up in the morning and he's excited and he's looking at Gabriel and he's like, oh, she's breathing. I just put some breath in their, in their lungs. Send some angels right now, right around that family. One day face to face. Now we know in part, but then we will know fully just as we are fully known. Why did Paul just go through that? He's basically saying, we preserve our oneness. We preserve our oneness even while serving with a variety of gifts, spiritual gifts, because it's eternal, love's eternal reality will outlast our gifts. The eternal reality of love will outlast your gifts. Your gifts have a missional, temporary, listen, focus and function for mission. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then shall Jesus come. Your gifts have an expiration date. You may discover some far more amazing things that God has called you to do in eternity. But as it is right now, your gifts are temporary. But you know what's going to last more than your gifts? Love. So your primary focus needs to be on loving one another. Jesus said you will, they will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. But I thought we were supposed to love the world. Didn't the Bible say that God so loves the world? Shouldn't we also love the world? Shouldn't we also serve the world? Love God, love people, make disciples? Absolutely, but guess what's going to attract them to this family when they see how we love each other, brother? When they see that whether you're red or blue or purple, I love you. I will give up my life for you. I'm going to take care of those kids if something happens to you. I'm going to adopt those children if you can't take care of them. If you believe in Roe versus Wade or not, I still love you. I'm not going to fight with you. I'm not going to have an attitude of arrogance and think I'm witnessing for Jesus Christ. I'm going to behave myself. That's not love. That's not the most excellent way. It's kind of like if you were to say, you know what, I want to focus on, the, on deepening the quality of my friendships, of my relationships. And I don't want just friends that are going to be friends with me because of something I do for them. But because they know me and they love me and I know them and I love them. And it's reciprocal. And therefore, maybe some friends start to exit from your life because guess what? When life happens and you can't do that thing no more, that's when you know who your real friends are. And this is what is happening here. Love is what's going to last. Love is what's going to last. Not what you're just doing for God, but why you're doing it for God. Why you're doing it for God matters. 
don't just cry, Lord, Lord. I pray nobody here merely cries, Lord, Lord, I did all a bunch of stuff for your name. He says, yeah, I saw that, but you didn't know me. You didn't, you didn't want to be with me. You didn't want to enter into the love that I'm so lavishly displaying for you at the cross. And that's actually what I want. Because all that stuff you do for me is naturally, through the Holy Spirit, going to happen. If you're focused in on my lavish love for you. Somebody today needs to go to the cross again. Somebody today needs to see God there willingly taking hell for you so that you can just get a glimpse into his indescribable, matchless love for you that will never end. Why not enter into that? Why refuse that? Why not let that be the current of how you serve with your spiritual gifts? Father, right now, we enter in, not because we're worthy, we know we're not, but help us to enter into your excellent way of love. Amen. I just invite you to stand as we just close with the worship song. Great are you, Lord. Great is his love. Amen. Thank you, my brother CJ, Pastor CJ, Pastor Cousins. Let's sing. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring life. You bring life to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. You restore. Every heart. Every heart that is broken. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Oh, Father, we give it to you today. We give it all to you, Lord. Come on, let's sing it again. Oh, you give life. You give life. You are love. You are love. Yeah. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. Come on, lift it up. Say, great are you, Lord. Can you do that? Come on, let's sing it again. All the earth, all the earth will shout Come on, your all this praise. Place, say, Our hearts will cry, these bones oh, will sing. Give it to you, say, great, great are you. Are
great are you, Lord. Come on, just take that with you today as you leave this place. Say, great are you, great are you, Lord. Oh, great in power, great in healing, great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. You're a Lord that restores, you heal, you save. Yes, Father, we thank you so much, Lord. You are great. You're worthy to be praised. And now as we leave this place, God, watch over us, bless us, and keep us, protect us, God. Guard the avenues to our soul. Help us to live the life of love that you purposed for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say amen, amen. Church, you may be seated as we get escorted out. Happy Sabbath.
and to our dear members who are in the church today. My name is Jean Gentinor. I will be the moderator for the Sabbath School panel today. To my left is our dear elder James Malone. And to my right is my dear sister elder Vanessa Anderson. Now, before we start, let's bow our head. As we pray, remember those words from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We will ask Brother Marlon to pray for us. Let us pray. Oh, dear Father, we come before you now as we open your word. And what a powerful word it is today. And we need your Holy Spirit to open our minds and our hearts so we can, we can see what you want us to see. We can hear what you want us to hear. We invite your presence right now with everyone, whether they're in, a, in their living room, in their bedrooms, here in the church, wherever we are, Lord. Help us to hear your voice speaking to us through your words today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So what has happened last week or the week before? Last week we studied um, our Sabbath school lesson. It was titled Joseph, the prince or the governor of Egypt. Um, some real events also had happened last week or the week before, if I am mistaken. Being an NBA fan, the Golden State Warriors, they won the championship, which I am not happy about. I hope it was Miami Heat. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, it happened that way. We had celebrated last week, Juneteenth, as a national holiday for the first time in the history of our nations. Something else had happened last week. Roe versus Wade is overturned by the Supreme Court. Inflation keeps on going up. Gas price is over $5. Biden has asked Congress to forego the gas tax. New information is surfacing every day. We heard about, unfortunately, the grilling crime that happened, the shooting that happened in Uvalde, Texas, in Buffalo. And uh, in our prayers, we will keep the family, the acquaintances in our prayer. January 6th hearing is still ongoing. Internationally, what else has happened? Colombia has elected um, a former guerrilla, a left-wing president for the first time in the history of Colombia. And uh, today, we are here to study the words of God. And the title of our Sabbath school lesson is Israel in Egypt. Before I jump into the lesson, let me just say, when I read about this lesson, it reminded me of myself. Being an immigrant coming from Haiti, moving to the States, I was very anxious. And I am thinking about Joseph going to Egypt, his father Jacob going to Egypt, his brothers, because of famine. And I am looking around, even in the panel today, I am guessing that quite a few of us are immigrants. I think Brother, Brother James came from the island, Antigua. And Vanessa, I am guessing, I always get it wrong. Go ahead, take a wild guess. You know what, I always get it wrong. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to put my feet in my mouth this time. <laughs> the beautiful island of Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Amen. And we have a guest here, too, who is from Trinidad and Tobago. Amen. For some Amen. reason, I always say Vanessa is from Jamaica. And I don't know why. Because I, my husband is from Jamaica. That's okay, why. then, okay. Yes. That explains it all. <laughs> um, the author of the Sabbath School lesson, our brother Jack Dukan, 
he did an amazing job opening the stories from the book of Genesis. Keep in mind that as you read Genesis chapter 1 until chapter 50, you can see there is a repeat. You can see creation and recreation. You can see order and disorder. You can see sin and grace. In the introduction of our lesson, he said something that is very interesting. For the sake of time, I will paraphrase. He penned it very well by saying, with the dramatic stories of miracles and judgments, witnessing to God's holy presence, Genesis is awe-inspiring. But Genesis is also a book with moving human stories of love, hatred, birth, death, murder, and forgiveness. It is also a book with lessons on ethics, faith, and the hope and promise of redemption. Meanwhile, the geographical movements of the book, thinking about Israel from Canaan to Egypt and back to Canaan, from Aden to Babel, to the promised land, to Egypt, to the prospect of the promised land, remind us of our nomadic journeys and nurture our hope for the real promised land, the new heaven and the new earth. As we follow the various character, characters across the pages of Genesis, we will discover that and pay attention to the last comment. Very interesting. Regardless of how different the time, place, culture, and circumstance, often the stories are in many ways ours as well. Mm -hmm. Today, we will fo focus on the story of Israel. The last Joseph. portion, uh, the, is, the, the history of Israel in Egypt. Okay. Yes, okay. that's correct. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, we can see that the last portion of the book of Genesis take one family at a time, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth. Now, let's go over some housekeeping rules. To our viewers online, we would ask you to submit your questions and we will do our best to answer them. And uh, I will dedicate Brother Marlon to answer them, and every one of us will come in to help him out um, if the questions are too difficult. Because we are not theologians, we are doing our best by the grace of God. Funny. And uh, to our members inside the church, we will dedicate hopefully 10 minutes, 10 to 5 minutes to you. All that you have to do, raise your hand, and then we will answer your questions. And we will really appreciate the fact that you are here. Now, there was a true story that has happened just recently. It was reported on New York Post. And if you go on YouTube, you can see the picture of the passenger and the air traffic control that helped the passenger land the airplane. On May 10, 2022, it was a recent Tuesday afternoon when the nightmare came true. The pilot of the airplane, Cessna Caravan, a 38-foot single-engine, 14 passenger aircraft, suddenly slumped over at the controls. <laughs> Moments later, a passenger clicks on the radio to, air, to the air traffic controller. I've got a serious situation here. My pilot has gone incoherent. I have no idea how to fly the airplane. Now, imagine yourself inside the cockpit telling the air traffic controller that you have no idea how to fly the airplane. Then the air traffic controller responded, Roger, what's your position? The voice of a dispatcher crackles over the speaker. And the passenger said, I have no idea. I can see the coast of Florida in front of me and I have no idea where I am. With the help of the air traffic controller, the passenger was able to land the plane safely. Mm. Now, why do I come up with that story in a journey that Israel or Jacob over to Egypt? Well, 
One thing I would like to leave with you today. As you listen to us talking about the lesson, I want you to have that recipe in mind. To have the recipe of a pilot, pilotless moments. Listen very carefully. Because had the passenger not listened very carefully, he would not have been able to land the plane. Follow the instruction in the Bible. Do not deviate from it. Since God is with you, maintain great calm. <laughs> now, for me to start the lesson, it would be fair to read, to start reading from Genesis chapter 45, verse 25 to 28. Now, read it for me, Brother James. Genesis chapter 45, verse 25 to 28. This is okay. just to set up the scene. So, starting from verse 25, it says, um, Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land. And Jacob's heart stood still, because he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now, what instruction can we, can we get from this passage? Two instructions. Before we, you break the news to an old man, be careful. Because as you can see in this lesson, Jacob's heart stood still. I think had the brother been wise, they should have found a way you know, to smooth out how to break the news to Jacob. And the second thing that I learned from this passage is that the brother came. Remember, those are the same brothers who sold Joseph. And at that time, Jacob didn't know that Joseph was alive. So he had some doubt. And because he had some doubt, he, he needed some evidence to confirm what they were saying was true. It was until he saw the cards that the spirit of Jacob revived he knows that his son was really alive. Um, one thing that keeps on coming to my mind is that reminded me of Thomas. We as humans, we always need evidence. Mm. And I'm telling you, faith is not about evidence. Faith is about things that you have not seen, you have not heard. Now we're going to jump into Jacob's journey to Egypt. Before I move into Sunday, Sunday lesson, I have a confession to make. And the confession that I'm making is that growing up, I, I grew up in a Baptist religion. So my mom, coming back from Haiti, every morning she will sing the same song. And the song goes like that. I hope that I had Vanessa's voice to sing that song with you, but... Unfortunately, like the preacher said, not my gift, but I do have love. And the song goes like that. O Canaan, in Creole, I'll translate for you. Bel Canaan, c'est là où je rete tout le temps, côté let ak miel coulé, côté qui pas jamais gen péché. C'est là ma prête vive sans fin pour toujours à Christ sauver moi. I'll translate for you. It goes, O Canaan, bel, beautiful Canaan, that's where I would like to live forever. Where milk and honey flow all the, all, all the time. Where there is no sin. That's where I want to live forever. Forever with Christ my Savior. Now, the second confession I would like to make to you is that it troubled me. Why would Joseph move from Canaan to Egypt? Well, let's jump into our Bible to see the reason why. 
The reason why is that there was a famine in Canaan and there was grain in Egypt. The only way for them to survive is for him and his family to move to Egypt. Um, let's read Jacob's journey to Egypt. Genesis chapter 46. And uh, we're going to read until verse 4 for the sake of time. Now for the readers online, and uh, we would ask you to read uh, in your personal time Genesis chapter 46 to 50 to have uh, or to understand really what is going on in the Sabbath school lesson. Genesis chapter 46 said, So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Behor Sheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the vision of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. Now, by saying Jacob two times, what came to your mind, Brother James? Um, what came to my mind is, you know, when you, as a parent, when you're trying to call your child and you, um, you, you say, you know, call their names, my children, and I say Aiden, and they say it once. It's no big deal, but when you say Aiden, Aiden, you know, it's a big deal. Yes. Um, you want to get the person's attention. Attention. You and want this to is important. Yes. yes. You want to chime in on that? No, I'm in agreement with what James said, but what automatically came to mind was uh, Samuel, when God called him. Uh, he didn't call him once, but I believe he called him thrice. Am I correct? Uh, so, yeah, it, it it's, it's em emphasizes, hey, I'm trying to get your attention. To get your attention. I remember saying the Bible story to my son many times, and my, his favorite story is Samuel. And I remember God calling Samuel, 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 two times. And God did the same thing with Abraham. God did the same thing with Moses. Yeah. And Jacob said, here I am. And Samuel did say the same thing. Here I am, God, your servant is listening. So he said, I am God the God of your father, do not fear. Let me pause on that word. Do you know that the word do not fear appears in the Bible 365 times? One time for every day of the year? <laughs> so we as Christians, this is a word that we should carry in our heart every day. Do not fear because your God is with you. And for I will make of you a great nation there. He repeated the same promise that he gave to Abraham. I will go down with you to Egypt. And I will also surely bring with you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. So Jacob arose from Beher Sheba and the son of Israel carried their father, their little ones and their wife. So they took their livestock, Jacob and all, in, and all his descendants, all together they were 70. Now the word 70 we, um, means in the Bible, all nations, without any exceptions. The Sabbath school, listen, Paul paused to ask a question. And the question that was being asked before we move to Monday lesson, when Jacob actually settled in Egypt, and our dear sister Vanessa will elaborate on that. The question that is being asked is that, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, and the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does Paul say here that shows the universality of the gospel? More important, what do these words say to us regarding what we as a church should be doing to help spread the gospel? And I will transition to Sister Vanessa to elaborate on that question. Okay. The question? The question is what do these words say to us regarding what we as a church should be doing to help spread the gospel? Well, basically, 
Abraham took 70 of all his family members, and all those 70 mm -hmm. people, they represent all nations mm -hmm. without any exceptions. Mm -hmm. So how do we church, what should we do to represent all nations in our message when we spread the gospel? Mm, that's a very good question. How do we represent or how do we spread to all nations? Uh, well, God is love and, you know, love transcends, you know, all peoples. Um, and so I believe if we approach people with the love of God and with the gospel, then certainly we'll be able to reach all nations. All nations without any distinction, regarding your, regardless of your race, your color, whoever you are. We should preach the, the gospel to all nations. Absolutely. With that said, um, Vanessa will elaborate on Jacob, actually no. Monday lesson, which is Jacob Settles in Egypt. Uh, Jacob, yeah, Monday's lesson is titled Jacob Confronts His Brothers. Okay. And, uh, or Joseph, rather, can I, confronts his brothers. On the last point, can I just say something that I yes. think is important for us to understand with sort of the all nation thing? Yes. Is um, there is also significance that we, um, Israel, uh, and through that line, God wanted to bless everybody, right? And there is sometimes a tendency to be exclusive and to say, here we have the blessing, God has mm -hmm. blessed us. He was blessing them so that they could bless, bless all nations, yeah. right? So through them and even going into Egypt, no matter where you are, you have that ability. God will put you in situations mm -hmm. where you have the opportunity to bless other people. Mm -hmm. Right, and we just can't forget that. Oh, absolutely, okay. and because I mean, because of the fact that they were who they are, they were called by God. Absolutely, you see how not just Egypt but all nations were blessed as a result of uh, J Jacob, um, you know, making provision for the future. Um, yeah, I do so agree with you, and I'm going to jump ahead in this lesson, where Jacob actually in Egypt, he blesses Pharaoh. He, he blessed Pharaoh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Genesis uh, chapter f in Genesis chapter forty-two, uh, Joseph confronts his his brothers. Um, so we're all aware. We're talking about the fact that there's a famine, um, and the famine uh, caused Jacob to send his ten sons to Egypt because they heard that you know there was grain there in Egypt, um, uh, and it's just the ten of them that went, not eleven, not Benjamin. They were very protective of Benjamin. Uh, because of the fact that they believed that uh, his older brother Joseph had uh, died. Um, Genesis 42, 6, here we have a providential meeting uh, of the brothers and the fulfillment of Joseph's first dream, um, where he dreamt that his grain bowed down to, uh, or their grain rather, bowed down to his grain. Um, so Joseph is now governor um, over the land, and he's lord over the land and he's in a position of power, and his brothers are now bowing the knee to him, unknowing that it is him, and he recognizes them, um, but they, of course, do not recognize him, and at, is at, it, it's at that time that Joseph remembers uh, his dream. Um, now Joseph begins to test them. Um, you know, so, First, he tests them by accusing them of being spies. Now, in Egypt, um, the penalty for spying is, is death, I believe. Um, and I'm wondering, well, why did he take this approach? Um, but he wanted to see where they were. Have they changed these many years, 20 years later or so? Have they changed? Are these, are these the same individuals that he dealt with? Um, you know, as when he was younger. Um, and he also wanted to gather information. Is his father still alive? Is his brother still alive? Um, and <laughs> what does he do? He proceeds to, he proceeds to put them in jail. Uh, and so he imprisons them for three days. And in these three days, Ellen White says that these three days were days of bitter sorrow as the brothers reflected upon their past sins. 
and they figured that they were facing retribution because of what they've done. Uh, so fast forward after three days, Joseph releases them, and he proceeds by testing them again, um, by telling them one of them must remain while the others, you know, go back home. Um, and he also wants them to bring back his brother, I mean, not his, well, his brother, Benjamin. You know, he wanted to see if they're telling the truth because, you know, they pretty much told him about the fact that, yes, uh, our, our father lives, we have a younger brother, you know, and so Joseph is like, okay, well, um, one of you remain in prison and the rest of you go back and bring back this brother that you say that you have. And, um, you know, Reuben now, I mean, they're all, in, they're all in agony, right? And in Genesis 42, 20, uh, 42, 22, you know, Reuben says, his blood is now required of us. This is echoed in his past warning to shed no blood. And this reinforces the link between what they are now facing and what they have done. Thank you, Sister Vanessa. We have a YouTube question, and the question said, in Genesis chapter 46, verse 3 and 4, God states that Israel will be made into a great nation in Egypt and not in the promised land. What advantage would Egypt offer in this development as a nation? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, and I know you look over here, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if I have an answer. I, I'm just going to be straight. I had more questions in this lesson than I had answers. Um, and, and I'll tell you, so what I found from this was kind of unique in terms of <sighs> Egypt was like an incubator for the, 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 the children of Israel. Right? It was where they needed to be prepared, the circumstances they needed to be in. And if you realize that Jacob, um, when he was on the way down and he says, fear not, in that same passage he mentioned, so uh, the, the Lord said to him, fear not. Why? He was afraid. People, God doesn't say fear not to people who are okay. He said fear not to people who are scared, right? If you're scared, you're like, hey, don't be afraid. So you have to think about it. He was leaving the promised land. He knows the promise that God promised for his people. And he was thinking, oh, we're going over here. Are we come, am I coming back? How is it going to work? You know, I don't know what it's going to be like. But the importance of being there in Egypt is the incubator where they had, they, they had this separate part in Egypt. They were able to, um, to bring back Joseph and his lineage into the whole children of Israel, right? And God was preparing them. Now, I don't know if God intended for them to be there for 400 years. I have a question for that, right? I mean, you could have just been 40 years, but who knows? They got comfortable. But I believe it was very important for them to be there. And I like to look at life application, and I'll end with this. There are going to be times in your life that God is going to take you down a path that doesn't, that seem counterintuitive to where he promised you that you are going to be. But don't fear, because it's in that situation that God is going to form you, create the environment that you can grow, and for you to do the work that you have to do. So you might be in some sort of Egypt situation, but just know that that's where God wants you so that you could germinate, you could multiply, that you could grow without, and protected without anybody fighting you. Like if maybe they were in Canaan, they would be fought against quite a bit. But they were able for years to grow and multiply into the nation that they needs to be in that incubator called Egypt. Amen. Um, if you allow me, I can just add a few things. And I can only add to what you have said before. I agree that Egypt is like an incubator. But the second thing that I would like to address in the question is when the viewer asks, what advantage do Egypt, Egypt have, has for Israel to be a great nation in their country? Let me address this portion. 
First of all, God can use you anywhere, any place that you are. Now, the advantages that Egypt has, remember that Egypt is not, they do not believe in the God of Israel, in the God of Jacob, in the God of Joseph. Joseph so much so knew that, that they have their own God. They do not serve our God. So by moving from Canaan to Egypt, they bring the gospel with them. They bring their God, their culture with them. Now, if you ask me what advantage do they have? Well, they have a great advantage. If you happen, if you happen to know my God through me, this is a great advantage to you. Now, to support what I am saying is that I am going to jump ahead because of the question. Um, remember when the borders of, 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 of Joseph came to Egypt and then Joseph has to present them to Pharaoh? And Joseph had to tell them, tell Pharaoh that you are shepherd. And one um, scholar comments in that, the reason why Joseph told his brother to tell, even though they were shepherd, but Joseph told them to say the truth. But here is the truth. The truth is that he knows the heart of his brothers. He knows that if Aaron does, do not send them to Goshen to, ship, to, to take care of the sheep, to be away from the idolatry, the culture of the Egyptians, they will be so embedded in that culture that they will be like them. So even though you are living in the world, but you not practice the culture of this world. And those are the advantages um, for Israel, for the son of Jacob, to be a great nation in Egypt. The second question that we have is, as we look to share Jesus with others, can we see a difference in going out into Egypt rather than being part of Egypt? What effect does that truth have on our witness for Jesus Christ? As we look to share Jesus with others, can we see a difference in going out into Egypt rather than being part of Egypt? What effect does that truth have on our witness for Jesus Christ? Um, the best way for me to answer this question is that, yes, you can go into Egypt because if you are, if I don't have a relationship with you, if you are not in my place, if the way that we practice ministry, the way that we share the gospel, we want people to come to church. We want people to come to you. This is not the way to practice ministry. It's to go out where they are to meet people where they are, to have a relationship with them, so that way you can share the love and the gospel. Otherwise, it won't happen. Don't expect people to come to church. You go out and do it. Which I don't know true. if you want to Which chime is in. true, but I believe that you have to be strong spiritually because some of us can lose our way and become like the people we're trying to win, especially if they're outside of the church. We ought to be in the world, but not of the world, right? We have to keep ourselves separate, but um, you know, we, we just have to be grounded in the word in order so that we're not assimilating or becoming like the world. So what you are saying is that we should be like Joseph and not the brothers of Joseph, where we can be wicked at times, but to have faith in Christ, to be anchored in Christ. Because if you are not you anchored in anchored. Christ and yeah. you go out to Egypt, you will be like the Egyptians. You will be serving their gods. You will be practicing, practicing what they do. Yeah. yeah, I understand. I agree with you 100%. I, I, I think about it really simply. Go wherever God sends you. All right? Because there are times when God sends you in the city Egypt where all the influences are, like Daniel was. But he says, don't be of it. But you're in it. Yeah. And there are times when he creates a situation like Goshen where they were out in Goshen, away from all the influences, and was able to germinate into the nation that they became, the nation of Israel, but God sent them there because, you know. So just be willing to go where God sends you and represents him there, represent him there, wherever you are. 
So you're telling them that they're not supposed to be like Jonah. Right? <laughs> Don't be like Jonah. Go where God sends you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, okay, we're running out of time. We would add Brother James, if you can come by Tuesday and Thursday, if possible. I, we I, only have 10 I, minutes. I'm left. just going to be brief, and I want to know if the audience have any questions. So I'll, let me set up Tuesday, and then I'll quickly ask if you have questions, because I have questions, okay? I, I just, I do. And I don't have all the answers, so maybe the answer is here. So Tuesday talks about Jacob blesses Joseph's son, and that's the, 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 the center of it. And there are a lot of nuance here and there, but I'm going to go straight for the interest of time. So what's happening here is that Jacob is sick and going to die shortly. And Joseph came to visit him with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Joseph, not Joseph, Jacob ended up, who's Israel, ended up blessing the two sons and basically adopting the two sons. Basically saying, look, Manasseh and Ephraim, they're mine. Joseph, they're mine. I'm going to treat them like my children. And any other children that you have after we have, we're here, there will be yours, Joseph, but these two are mine. Now, I don't understand the significance of that, right? But the other thing I notice here is that he blesses with his right hand Ephraim, who is the younger one, and, and Manasseh with his left, right? So in, in those days, the older one will typically be the one that get the birthright, get the full blessing. Here he's flipping it on their head. And Joseph said, oh, no, no, because you can't see, you're, you're mixing them up. No, Manasseh should be getting that blessing. Mm -hmm. Jacob is like, no, I know what I'm doing. Right. Yeah, you think I can't see, but I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I just, for the life of me, can't understand what's the significance of that. Why is he blessing the younger than the older? And why does this keep happening in the family? Mm -hmm. Right? It happened with Isaac, where Jacob and Esau, where Jacob got the blessing. It, 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 it's happened where Jacob is giving some preference to Joseph over the older brothers, right? Now it's happening again. Why does this keep happening, and what is the significance of that? I want to throw it out to the panel, or I want to throw it out to anybody out there. Yes. Wow, I never thought of that. One, the, the, if you, got, you I'm can't sorry, hear. For, for our for the, viewers, can yeah, you yeah, just repeat? I'm going to repeat it. Okay, cool. So what a member in the audience says, and maybe we should have my, um, the member of the audience says is that it was a way for, for, for Jacob to, sh to, to show that he himself did not need to steal the birthright, and it could happen per, um, peacefully, and that was his way of showing that that what could happen that's an interesting perspective there was another hand and then i yes okay yes i'm thinking it's a direct connection the idea is Use that the it's a direct connection to the idea that uh when we take we are first we come first we are entitled and god is reminding us remember the last be will be the least will be first and the first shall it be it happened last. twice and he accepted it yeah. all right god is reminding us the last should be first and the first will be first mm -hmm. there is one more to my white right here no, to, to my white uh, oh, okay. that's okay you can go ahead and after that you can pass on the mic i think it happens again when, uh, when the sons of Judah, the older one was actually, it's actually the last one uh, that took over. And I think it, it showed that the Lord is in control, right? Amen. Yes. Okay. No, no other questions, no other comments? Okay, we only have 52 seconds left. 
and unfortunately we have to wrap up the Sabbath school lesson and we will ask our dear sister Vanessa to close us in prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this time spent uh, in your word. Uh, we thank you for the lessons learned. Um, we know, Father, that you ultimately are in control of our future, of our destination, Father. We just pray, Father, that you'd help us to hear your voice and to be obedient and willing. Father, I pray that you'd use us as vessels to bless others. Help us, Lord, to be willing to go where you send us and to be, Father, that vehicle that would win men, women, boys, and girls, regardless of where they come from, regardless of where they are. May we win them to your throne, Father, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome, welcome to those of you here in uh, the building and to those of you online. We welcome you to Plantation Seventh day Adventist Church. Uh, we are here to worship our great God, our sovereign God, the ruler of the universe. And I want to invite you to stand with me as we welcome his presence here and as we get started with our service. Amen. Amen. Please bow your heads with me. Eternal Father and ever wise God in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord, in this space to worship and praise your holy name. God, we give you honor and glory this morning because you're worthy. You are worth it, Father. Thank you so much for who you are. And thank you so much for calling us, Father, from darkness to light. We invite your presence here this morning, Father. Bathe our hearts with your love. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit. I pray that not one person here would leave the same way they've come in, Lord, but that they'd leave here changed and transformed and drawn a little bit closer to you, Father. I pray that you'd bless the service, Father. And Lord, as we lift your name up in praise, we pray that the blessings will flow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. I have a question for you. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Do you know there was wonder working power in the blood of Jesus? How many of you know that this morning? Amen. And I want you to sing with me. Power in the blood. Come on, let's sing. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Would you be free from your passion and There's pride? Power. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's high. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Power, healing power, amen. Is our God great? Yes. 
We're going to sing about his greatness, his goodness. Has he made you glad today? Uh, Is that a smile I'm seeing under your masks? (laughs) Listen, God has made us all glad because, listen, he has promised you in a life of eternity with him. We're going to have a big party when we get to heaven. And I want you guys to sing this song with us. It's a new song to the church, but we're going to sing it for you a little bit. And I promise you, you're going to get it. Song says, I'll give thanks to the Lord. Even if you don't know, you can do this. Yeah. Yes, yes, there you go. Oh, oh, oh. Listen to the, listen, say it. I'll give thanks to you, Lord, and sing praise to your name, O Most High. I'll declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness by night for you oh lord have made me glad i will sing for joy at the works of your hand and rejoice in what you have done i'll give thanks thanks to you lord to you lord and sing praise and sing praise to your name almost high i'll declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness by night for you oh lord have made me glad i will sing for joy at the works of your hands and rejoice in what you have done and rejoice in what you have done Lord, you are the strength of my life. For you, oh Lord, have made me glad. I will sing for joy at the works of your hand and rejoice in what you have done. And rejoice in what you have done. Oh, Lord, how great are your words? Oh, Lord, how great are your words? Oh, Lord, how great are your words? 
made me glad, oh God. This next song is actually also entitled Made Me Glad because our God is a good God. I don't know about you, we're not gonna get tired. I know some of you might have just gotten a little tired out just now. But we're gonna go to a place, if you're a believer like me, where we'll never grow tired. We'll never grow weary. There'll be no more death there, no more crying. Isn't that a place you wanna go? Look at what's happening in this world. We need to find that place in Jesus and God today where we never get tired, we never grow weary. God is an awesome God. We worship you, Father. Forever we'll worship you. all join in the sin. I will not sing. I will not be moved. And I'll say of the I'll say of the Lord. Lord. You are my shield. My strength. My, strength, my portion. My portion. Deliver. My shelter. Strong. Oh! 
my very presence help me in time Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for our very present help. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Praise God. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning, church. For those who are in-house and those who are joining us online, we thank God that we can assemble ourselves together as we seek to connect with God. It's good to see you. Those who are members, welcome. And those who are guests, welcome. We hope that as you worship God with us today, that you will enjoy His blessings. For those uh, uh, watching online, let me just say here, you're missing out. You're missing out on the in-person dynamic. There is nothing like worshiping together in person. Come on, say amen. And want to remind you, you can go ahead and register for our services. Uh, if you don't get a chance to do that online, you can do that at the desk. We ask you when you come uh, to worship that you be mindful of your neighbor. I know for some folks, wearing a mask is against their religion. But for the love of your neighbor, please wear a mask. Amen. Because I know it may be against your religion, but because you love your neighbor, I ask you just to wear a mask. One more. Uh, notice, as you know, next Sabbath will be an extra special Sabbath in the life of our church as we seek to, to affirm what God has affirmed uh, some years ago in the, in the commissioning service of our own Pastor Jennifer Hernandez. Amen. Uh, next Sabbath, the folks uh, from up north, Orlando, will be here as we join in in affirming what God has done and what God is doing in her life. We thank God for her ministry. This time I'm going to ask uh, the elders who are here just to join me along with our first elder, Elder Mozart and her launch. I hope I got that right. And the family, please join us here as we seek to affirm uh, their ministry together. As some of you know, it was during the pandemic that, that Elder Mozart was chosen to serve our church as first elder. And so we, we never got a chance to, to affirm him in front of the congregation. I've been here since April, and I must say uh, succinctly, he's a good guy. We, we've had some very good conversations. And I thank, <laughs> give it some time. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we converse a lot as we talk about the vision here uh, at the church and the mission of expanding the gospel to those who are lost. And I thank God for Elder Mozart and his family. Amen. The heart of service that he has. And we just thought uh, we would affirm him uh, today. We have some gifts. He did not know of this uh, until the first service, that, there, that this is the result of a grand conspiracy that took place behind his back to ensure that we can affirm our elder. We have some gifts, and going to allow the folks to make the presentation. And I understand uh, his, his, his dad is on hand. Amen. Could you join us, dad? Uh, it would be such a beautiful thing. Uh, uh, Pastor, uh, come, come and join us, uh, along with your wife, if she can come, come ahead. His mother is, is also here. Uh, and, and by the way, he had no idea we were doing this. I think he told me a brother was in town and the, the family was getting together, something like that. And so uh, they are in tow, had no idea uh, we planned to, we planned to ambush him like this. But we want to thank God, uh, and I say this sincerely, for his heart of ministry, his heart of wanting to see the kingdom of God expand here uh, at a plantation. And we, we, we thank God that we can be working alongside each other. You know, as a pastor, it's one of those key persons uh, for, for you and your ministry to ensure 
that you, you, you have a first elder with whom you can not only communicate, but with whom uh, someone who has the same passion of ensuring that uh, ministry, ministry is done in the local church. So we have some presentations. Uh, who do I turn it over to? Go ahead, uh, Mike. So um, we got some gifts here for our dear elder. But we want to start with a special person because he believes this is about him. You see, we get to work with him, talk with him, but we are lucky because we don't live with him. <laughs> so it takes a really special person to put up, I mean, to support him. <laughs> And because we know that you are praying for your husband, love him unconditionally. All this time that he spent in meeting and, and, and doing what God has called him to do, you, you, you have been an amazing woman. So we want to recognize you and thank you for all that you do. Amen. Absolutely, Halange, you are his backbone and we're so grateful. And on behalf of the entire church, the elders, leadership here, we want to present you with this beautiful bouquet. Okay. Amen. And a little token of our love right here. And you this, can... this is for our dear friend, an elder. And this is for your daughters. If, if you see the, the person, and they're always busy. Um, Alex is always on camera or, or, or she's coordin coordinating the person or singing. So the person of family is always serving God. So we, we thank you for everything you do. May God bless you, keep you, and just enlarge your territory. Everything that you do, we just pray that we continue to bless you and keeping you loving with this loving care. Amen. Thank you so much. Elder Mike, we, we want to pray together and just ask you just to bow your heads. And if you are able just to reach your hand out as we reaffirm God's call upon this family's life. Father God, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you, Lord, that you can use us, mere mortals, to do such an important work. We thank you for the Persina family, the way in which you have used them to expand the kingdom. We thank you for their service of their time, the commitment of their resources and of their gifts to the work of reaching lost men and women. We pray that you continue to love through them. You continue to provide and bless others through them. And may as we work together, we'll all have the joy of meeting Jesus in peace we ask. In his name, amen and amen. Uh, thank you so much, guys. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us to church. Bless that we will learn 
learned something about you today. In your holy person's name, amen. All right, so how many of you guys are familiar with the story of Naaman? One, two, okay. All right, so oh, some of you guys know, but some of you guys don't know. So just to refresh, Naaman was a commander of an army, or he was a commander of a general in his nation, so he had an important role. But one day, he came down with leprosy, and in case you guys don't know what leprosy is, it's a disease that makes your skin white and uncomfortable. And the way that they handled it at the time, they didn't really have a cure or anything. So they sent people outside of the city, and that's how they handled it, because they didn't know how to cure it. It was really contagious. So with Naaman having his high position and everything, um, he really wanted to get better. So a servant girl who worked for him came up and said, you should see the prophet Elisha, because he can heal you. So that's what he did. So Naaman went to the prophet Elisha and asked him to heal him. And he, Elisha said that God can heal you if you go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times. So that's where Naaman went to do. But in case you guys aren't familiar, the Jordan River is a really dirty river, and it's not really somewhere you want to be dipping in or bathing in or anything. But Naaman, he really wanted to be healed. So he listened to God's instructions and started dipping in the river. So... After the first couple of times of dipping in the river, there was no change in anything. So you might, he might have been skeptical or might have been like, this isn't working, it's dirty, nothing's happening. But he decided to listen to God's instructions and continue. So he did. And after the seventh time, he came back up and the leprosy was completely gone. It was a miracle. His skin was clean and he was happy. And he went up to Elisha and he was like, thank you, thank you so much for healing me have all these gifts and everything out of gratitude. Thank you so much. And Elisha said, I didn't heal you. It was God who healed you. So I won't accept any of these gifts. Go back, go back. So Naaman was like, all right, I'll take my stuff and go back. Thank you, thank you so much. Praise God. So Elisha had someone who worked for him and his name was Gehazi. And he heard that Naaman had come by with all his gifts for being healed and everything. And that Elisha didn't accept them, that he went back and took them with him. But Gehazi wanted the gifts, so he went back or in, went after Naaman and s lied and said that uh, Elisha had some a guest over, and so he needed some clothes and some silver for the guests. And Naaman, being healed and better and grateful, didn't have any problem, and he was like, okay, okay, here, take the gifts. So Gehazi took the gifts, and he went back to his place and left them there since he lied and everything. And then he went to Elisha. And Elisha said, where did you go? And Gehazi said, I didn't go anywhere. And Elisha said, I know you went somewhere. You went, you went after Naaman to get the gifts. And that wasn't good because God had said for them not to accept any gifts because he had healed him. So the result of his actions was that God cursed him with Naaman's leprosy. And it was almost instantaneous. And he said that his family for the rest of the generations would get or be prone to leprosy too. So in this story, you have Naaman who followed God's instructions and dipped in the river the certain amount of times just like he was supposed to and was healed. He got the rewards. And then you have Gehazi who didn't follow God's instructions and suffered the consequences. God only wants what's best for us and that's why he gives us our, his instructions and we need to follow them so we don't suffer the consequences. So I want you guys to remember that as you go throughout your week, to listen to God's instructions and follow them well. Would any of you want to pray to end? All right, I can pray to end. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this week and thank you for this day and thank you for guiding, protecting us and keeping us safe. Uh, please help today to continue to be a good day, and please help us to listen to your instructions. And thank you for everything. In your name I pray, amen.
for our ministry in action. Gonna ask uh, Knut to join me here along with, uh, is it Knut and Michael? Are both of you coming? Oh, or Elder Mo, yes. As some of you know, the end of this month, next month, July, we'll be having a very special event, and we want to just give you some information to help you to appreciate that it's more than just event. And so I have these three persons here, and hopefully they can give, they can give me some answers as to what is the main purpose, what are we seeking to achieve, Canute, with this health ministry fair? Uh, church family, what we are hoping to achieve, you know, we've been talking about this paradigm shift for the church, um, you know, and we are trying to get out in the community and meet people, and we're doing this community health fair and expo where we're going to be able to get out in the community and meet people and cater to their needs. Uh, can you tell me, uh, Ella Barbara, what are some activities that we have planned for, for the day? We have a myriad of activities, but as, as, as Knut says, the main purpose is to get out in the community and reach the community. So the activities, we're going to have activities planned for the kids. We're having um, rock, the rock climbing wall, bounce houses, face painting. But importantly, we will have opportunity where you can learn about health and the laws of health and be interactive. We'll have diabetic screening. We're going to have heart screening, different things that you can use that you can... Um, improve your health. So uh, it's a family fun day. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, Elamo, I know in, in preparation for the day, we've had to do some ask and get some authorization from the city. Could you just give a quick feedback as to how, how, how that is going and what has been the response of the city thus far? Well, the, the city has been very receptive to our goal here, which is to have this great health fair to reach out into the community. While we had to seek um, permits and fill out a bunch of different forms, they have been excited about this event that we're bringing to the city that's going to impact each and every member. So the city's excited, and we're hoping you guys will be excited to join us on the July 31st for this event. All right. Could you tell us uh, quickly, Canute, who are the persons involved? How many persons do we need to be involved? Can I get involved, and how? Okay, so we are looking for at least 100 volunteers. Folks, we are, we are planning this event and we need every one of you. I'm here representing health ministry, but guess what? This is not a health ministry event. Yes. It's a church-wide event. We want everyone to be involved. Doctors, nurses, greeters, whoever you are, you can be a part and of I this And I understand that there will be training for those who volu volunteer, those who uh, want to get involved, that training will be provided? We're going to be providing lunch on July 9th and July 23rd. We're going to be training you. We're going to be preparing you for this event. So you'll yeah, be well trained yeah. and you'll be fed. Come out on yeah, July 9th yeah. and July 23rd. Right. I, I couldn't help noticing that you mentioned the lunch before the training. <laughs> I think that may be uh, intentional. Uh, just quickly, Barbara, could you say something about, there's a program I think we'll be sharing there called New Start. Could you say something just a bit about that? Yes, new start, exactly as it stands for. It's about a new start on your health, a new start on your life. And it looks at nutrition, it looks at water, it looks at natural things that you can use. That has been proven so many years. I mean, the Seventh-day Adventist way of health has been studied and has been proven to be um, the key way for restoring your health. So we'll be discussing new start, which is all about using God's natural gifts amen. in restoring your health. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, thank you so much. We want to pray f about this. And folks, they're signing up folks there at the, uh, at the front. Uh, please get involved. We'll ensure that it's training. Remember that this will be our opportunity as a church to connect with community and to serve our community. And so in prayer, Father, we thank you for this initiative. We thank you for the leaders. We pray that you'll give us the spirit to get involved so we can make an impact here in the city of Plantation, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.
Good afternoon, church family. Happy Sabbath. It's time to worship the Lord with our tithes and offering and our gifts. Hosea chapter 8, verse 7. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. This law of sowing and reaping is established in Hosea chapter 8, applies to every areas of life. For example, you plant one mango seed, and when it bears, you reap many mangoes. Each act is a seed planted in all characters that will multiply in favor of the rewards of heaven or eternal death. Little sins have big consequences, and small act of kindness have great rewards. As we give of ourselves to the Lord, let us come, let it come from a heart of gratitude and love and watch the Lord multiply his goodness in us. Bring all the tithes, offerings, and gifts into the storehouse of the Lord and prove him today. Let us pray. Father and God, again, we come before you thanking you for the gift of life, thanking you for love, health, and strength, thanking you for providing for us. And as we provide for us and we give to each other, give back the blessing to each other, may you bless it with thanksgiving we pray in Jesus' name. Praise God, everyone. I'm going to invite you to stand where you are and join us as we continue to worship. Um, I was looking over some statistics and uh, it, it, it dawned on me because I kind of crunched the numbers a little bit. It said that the number one mental disorder in the world today is anxiety disorder. And I don't know if anybody, and I'm not sure if you even want to raise your hand, has dealt with anxiety. If you've dealt with anxiety, just let's go ahead and raise our hand. And I want you to look around a little bit. You're not alone. Other people have dealt with it. People are dealing with it right now. The beautiful thing about our God is he's given us a cure. When you go to Matthew, and I'm going to take it down to chapter 6, and you jump down to verse 25. He tells us not to be worried about your life as to what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. And then in verse 26, my birth verse, 626, says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor do they reap or heap into barns, but your heavenly father, he feeds them. When you look at the birds outside and Sometimes they get on my nerves because they, they, I open the door with a bag of groceries or something. Guess who's right there? The birds, right? They know where their food's coming from and they don't worry. So why are we who are made in the image of Jaira himself always so worried about where we're going to get that provision? He is the provider. He's our provider. And I'm just going to invite you guys to sing this song, Jaira, with us. If you believe and know like I do that God provides for us and he loves you with a, a reckless love, a love that we don't deserve, to be honest. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything I've done and he loves us anyway. Amen. 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 Let's just sing today. I'll never be more loved than I am right now Wasn't holding you up So there's nothing I can do to let you down 
It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud And I'll never be more loved than I am right now Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind yeah, yeah. to call me out. You, you would cross an ocean, ocean so I, I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. Come on, all over this place, let's say, Jairus. You are enough. If you know to be a provider, say lift it up. Jaira, you are enough. Say I will be. I will be content in every, in every circumstance. Cause you are Jaira, you are enough. Yeah, yeah, say. Cause he's forever enough. Always enough. Always more than enough. Hey, forever enough, always enough, always more than enough. Come on, join us and say, I don't want to forget how I feel right now on the mountaintop. I can see so clear what it's all about. Come on, sing, say, stay by my side when the sun goes down. Right now. I know what you've spoken. I'm already loved more than I can imagine. Come on, is this you today? And that is enough. Come on, is this you today? Let's sing it and sing it again. I'm already loved. Already loved. I'm already chosen. Yeah. 
because he is more than enough more than enough I don't know what your situation is I'm not certain what you're going through but I can tell you that God is more than enough for your circumstances more than enough and that that goes right into the text that I was impressed to go to this morning and that text is Psalms uh, 63 the 63rd division of Psalm verses 3 to 5 and I want you to listen to this closely it says because your love is better than life I'm gonna read that again because your love is better than life my lips shall praise you thus I will bless you while I live I will lift up my hands in your name my soul shall be satisfied my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips he's more than enough and your soul will be satisfied but here is the key his love is better than life so I want to encourage you now I'm not sure of the burden that's on your heart uh, I, I don't know if you're struggling with a child if you are worried about financial matters I'm not sure whether or not you are lonely and anxious because many are lonely and anxious but I want to tell you right now God's love can fill you and it's better than life so if you have any of those burdens on your heart or there's just something you want to praise God for you thank him for his love I'm gonna ask you to come down and pray with me bring that down now I know we typically have cards we don't have that right now but if you want to write it on a paper bring it put it in an open Bible you could do that also if you just have it on your heart just come forward if you're watching online take this time to just breathe that prayer to God as we pray together uh, for him to satisfy us let's pray Father in heaven we come before you this morning and we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to praise your name we have the opportunity to say thank you for all that you have done for us and I just want to thank you for the praise team for the song selection because it couldn't have been a more perfect song that says no matter what the circumstances and as I am praying here in this room with so many different people with so many different circumstances I know some of the circumstances seem overwhelming to some of us but their father the songwriter says you are more than enough your words in the psalm says your love is better than life and that we will be satisfied by your love their father I want to thank you for the time when we thought that all was going to come crashing down and somehow you worked a miracle out that we were able to get out of that situation Lord I want to thank you for your grace when we know that we have gone we, we did something that was not right we, we, we neglected you you we, we went astray the, the sin problem was there but Lord your grace is sufficient for us and you gave us um, your love that covers the multitude of sin yes, their father even as we pray and we recognize your greatness and your love and how much you care for us we still have things on our hearts that are burdening us there is someone here in the hearing of my voice now that's feeling a sense of loneliness and they could be in a room full of people they could be on social media talking to 
to, to hundreds of followers or whatever, but yet still they feel lonely, empty, and wondering, where do I go from here? Nothing can fill this feeling that I have. Dear Father, I pray for that person right now. I pray for the dark cloud that, that will be removed. I pray that the emptiness will be filled and that they will find you and they will sense your love wrapping them, um, wrapping them up right now. They will sense that you are there and that your love is more than enough and that you can satisfy all what they're looking for. Help them to run to you and not to other things. Dear Father, there are some before right now that are struggling. For years, they've been praying for their, child, their child or their children. Their children now are young adults or they're teenagers or and no matter what, they've been struggling with the same problem, whether it's physical, mental, whether it's going astray, away from God and uh, struggling with maybe substance abuse, whatever that circumstance may be. And you're praying for your child over and over and you see no result. Dear Father, help us to realize that you're an on-time God and that you love them more than we can ever imagine. And you will come through for them and that your love is more than enough for them. Dear Father, I pray that child will find you now and will seek you, that mother that's praying, that father that's praying, that their prayers will be answered today. Dear Father, I pray for those who are grieving. They have lost someone and no matter what happened, they can't fill that void of the loss of that loved one. Dear Father, comfort them today. Comfort, help them to sense through us through members and brothers and sisters in the community and, and others around that you will work through them. Send that right person right now to say the right words or to do the right deed or to just be there for them so that they can say, we had an encounter with God. Lord, please comfort those who are mourning now. And their Father, there are those who are worried financially. Things have been okay, but they can see in the horizon. Their rent is going to go up by $900 a month. Their, their, their job is looking for ways to cut. They're in a situation now where their business is going down. And they're like, Lord, how do I make it? How do I do it? Help them to know that you're the God that provided yesterday. You are going to provide. You're providing today and you will provide tomorrow. Give them that faith, Lord, to believe. And their Father, I pray finally for the one who is going to pre um, speak the word today. You have given him a message. I know it's a timely message, and it's not a message generally just for everybody. It's a message for this church at this time, for every person that's sitting in this pew right now. I pray that you will speak your words through um, CJ, Lord. I pray that you will be with his family and cover him. And no matter what the circumstances, he will continue to serve you as he seek to represent you in this world today. So dear Father, at the end of it, I pray that we all will leave here knowing full well that your love is more than enough for us and we will choose your way rather than our way. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Chira, you are enough. Chira, you are enough. I will be, I will be content in every circumstance. In every circumstance. Cause you are Chira, you are enough. Our speaker today is Pastor C.J. Cousins. Uh, this is home for him. Currently, he serves our church. Amen. We currently he serves our church in the Potomac Conference, Potomac Conference there in uh, Maryland, Virginia area, and he's also serving as the interim pastor 
at the Vienna SDA Church in North Virginia. The family is here in tow. Uh, thank you so much, CJ, for consenting. Come to share the word. I know God has a word uh, for us through you. I'm hoping and praying that we'll receive the word. And may the same spirit that was with you in, pre in preparation be with you now in your presentation. May you be blessed. It's good to be back home. Amen? All right, so before we go to work, the preacher's heart is full and his Bible is on fire. So I'm going to need you to take out your Bibles, whether print or electronic, because really and truly didn't come to see CJ, came to see Jesus. We want him to be exalted, we want him to be lifted up, we want him to be heard. I cannot uh, move forward without first thanking um, James and the church and Pastor Rose for the invitation to come and the privilege to speak at this pulpit. This is my home. This is my, my church home where I grew up. I left here in the fall of 2006, and uh, I've been away in Georgia and in Michigan and Maryland and now in Northern Virginia. But this has always been home for me. So the really and truly, this is a homecoming. And so I'm excited to be here. I've seen so many faces. I don't have time to name all of them. And I love, by the way, that I'm hearing young people right now because it tells me that this church is growing. Amen? And my kids are going to be chiming in very soon anyway. So that's all right with me. But I'm happy to be here. I really, really am. Those of you watching online, I want to greet you and thank you for joining us today as well. But why don't we go ahead and pray? We want to ask God to be with us as we get into his word. And we really want what he has in store for us, the needs that we have brought to this worship experience to be met as we go and engage in his word now. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, thank you, thank you in advance for what you're going to do as a result of this word. Already I know, Father, because of all the spiritual warfare that has preceded this moment to prevent me from actually being here to present at this moment, clearly you have something that you want to say to somebody sitting here today or watching right now online. This is a moment that you have ordained, and I thank you in advance that, you've used, that you're using an imperfect vessel to communicate a beautiful, perfect, and loving God. Right now, we are asking that your beautiful, rich, indescribable character of love will come through, through the text, and that that love will be revealed most vividly and clearly in your son, Jesus Christ, him crucified and risen for us. And that Holy Spirit, you will bring that home to our hearts and allow it to fuse into our lives and flow out to those around us in our sphere of influence. We want to be those that love God, love people, and make disciples. Help us to be real conduits of that experience. We thank you in advance, Father. Have your way now in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. It was a really joy and privilege to watch her as she would serve and lead in the serving of the children of our church, particularly as the adventurer's director. But I could not understand for the life of me why, Kathy, she just could not seem to get along with people. She just couldn't seem to get along with people, particularly in the church, those that were parents. And I, I was trying to wrap my head around this because she's so good at what she does, so organized, so professional, so just life-giving to what was going on with our, with our youth and our children particularly. And then I, I kind of discovered an experience that happened with her and the parents where she organized a very thorough, well-put-together manual when it came to the adventurers. And when they would have questions that they want to ask her directly, she would say, go check the manual. That's why I put it together. I mean, you don't need to talk to me when everything is right there in the book. And they felt a little kind of put back by that. And then I discovered also being a rookie pastor at the time, I've been pastoring now for nine years, being a rookie pastor at the time, I discovered that this had been a pattern with her, just not getting along and having some conflict with people in other churches, maybe two or three churches prior to the one that I was at at the time, and that this was a pattern and then one day she was there meeting with us, the pastoral staff of the church, just having casual conversation. And then finally when we brought this up, she just came right out and said it. She said, listen, 
I just want to come here, serve the children of the church as the adventurer director, and go home. I don't want to have to engage and nurture relationships and manage and steward relationships. I just want to come. In essence, in essence, what she's saying, family, is she's saying, I want to be here to focus on the task and not the people. And maybe you've experienced or witnessed something like this, or maybe, maybe I'm talking to someone who's actually been like this, and maybe all of us at some level can, re can relate to that experience. But here's the thing. This type of mindset, it could be that it was someone that just doesn't want to engage in relationships and they're having conflict. They don't know how to manage those relationships well. They're not to love well. But it could also be that you've experienced someone that's very gifted, very talented, but also they feel like their gift is better than everybody else's gift. Their gift is the one that needs more prime time. It needs to be more visible, right? Or maybe they feel like it's some kind of competition when it comes to their gift and everybody else's, right? And this is problematic, church, you know why? Because this is one of the reasons why a lot of churches experience a lot of hurt, woundedness, and division. And this is what's on the pastoral heart of Paul. As he writes to the church in Corinth, in Greece. Now, if you're at all familiar with the story of Scripture and the book of Corinth and that church, you'll, you'll understand very quickly, if, you, if you're familiar with that book, that he's dealing with a church that's jacked up and messed up in all kinds of ways. This church has dealt with sexual immorality and incest, and it's, it's, he's dealing in this book with people that are kind of getting a little more selfish and self-righteous, and, 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 and they are also very gifted, but they're also very divided. And he's now here writing, addressing one of the particular areas that they're divided in, in the passage that we're about to take a look at now. Now, when, if you're like me growing up, I would read the Bible, particularly the writings of Paul, particularly, where it seems like he's all over the place, right? And you would conclude one chapter, and you would think, oh, well, he just concluded a thought. So the next chapter, he's now going to move into another thought. And then the next chapter, he's going to move into another thought, right? But what you'll discover is that the Bible, when it was put together, the Holy Spirit led, but human beings were involved, and they, in, in order to help us have a little bit ease of read and reference, they gave us chapter divisions and verses and punctuation that was not there in the original text. Are you with me? And so the thought that Paul introduces as we now get ready to dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the preacher should have given you enough time to get there by now, right? He is going to continue his thought beyond chapter 12 into 13, where we're going to be today, and he'll continue it and conclude it in chapter 14. What's the thing that's on his heart? Well, when I was growing up and reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12 particularly, I thought that his primary subject was spiritual gifts. That's what he's dealing with in chapter 12. And then he's going to leave spiritual gifts, and he's going to move into something else that we're going to talk about in a second. But what you'll discover is that Paul has one complete thought, one true north, from chapters 12 to 14. And he is talking about spiritual gifts, yes, in chapters 12 to 14, but the primary reason he's dealing with spiritual gifts is because he has a deeper subject to address. And that is our oneness, listen, our oneness, our unity, and our equality as the body of Christ. It's from this context that he moves into the subject of spiritual gifts. Why? People were in the church thinking that their gift, there's a Jamaican way of saying this, that may not be the most appropriate for this setting right now. But some people say your poop can make patty. Somebody understood what I just said. All right. Please forgive me if you didn't understand the context. Hopefully I can receive forgiveness and grace later and explain that context. But the idea there is that you think your, your gift is more special than everybody else's. And, and it's causing division in the church. Now I know I'm dealing with a church here. This is my home church, okay? I know I'm dealing with a church, and I'm watching it happen right now, and I was so, my heart is so full from seeing the first service and experiencing it. But there's gifted people in this church serving in a variety of ministries with different kinds of spiritual gifts. And so maybe you've asked this question. And here's our question for today that we're going to consider. What is the best way for us to preserve our oneness while serving with a variety of spiritual gifts. What's the best way? 
Why? Why am I asking that question? Well, because Paul, concluding chapter 12, he says that I'm now, I just talked about how to stay unified, and I just talked about spiritual gifts and how that plays in, and, and he, he first out says that the Holy Spirit is the source of your spiritual gifts. He's the one that's moving and working through all of your gifts, right? One spirit, multiple gifts and ministries, yes? But then he goes on to say, you are one body, which is that word one, comes up over and over and over again. The idea is unity. You're one body with a variety of unique gifts. And then he'll say, but here's how you guys need to interact while you're exercising those gifts. You need to care for one another because you need each other. You need to care for one another because you need each other. And I'm going to say parenthetically here, I said it in the first service, I'll say it again. This is the reason why in Hebrews chapter 10, it says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, i.e. in person or virtually, amen. Not in an arbitrary sense, like, hey, you got to be here, we're going to check and count, right? No, because you are a body. My finger can't do without my palm. My head can't do without the neck. You're needed. You're a part of a family. We are one. So how do we preserve it while we have all these different gifts? Well, come with me now. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Are you there? Let everybody say amen if you're there. Okay, and then if you're there, please let me know then by saying, I am here. And then if you're not asleep, please let me know by saying, I'm awake. Amen. Let's dive into the word of God. The Holy Spirit now will instruct us through Paul. Here it is. Verse number one of chapter 13. If I speak with the tongues of men, that's humanity, right? Human beings. And of angels, but do not have what? love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, yes? If I have the, listen, this is unique to us now. This is very special to us. If I have the what? The gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have what? Love, I am nothing. Verse 3. And if I have all, and if I give all my possessions to feed the what? The poor. That's an important ministry, amen? We have that ministry flowing out of this church, yes? And even if I surrender my body to be what? Burned. That's martyrdom. That's being like burning at the stake. But if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. In the courts of heaven, it was like, well, that was a waste. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? But Paul is elevating an excellent way. Some translations will say a more excellent way. I prefer the translations that actually bring it out that it is the most excellent way. The way of being in the world, the way of being in the body. Notice that Paul just mentioned some of the spiritual gifts. It's because why? He is continuing the same theme. He's continuing the same subject. He's talking about spiritual gifts through three chapters. He mentions speaking in tongues, speaking in other languages. He talks about the gift of prophecy. He talks about knowledge. He talks about faith. He talks about the self-sacrificing, giving to the poor, and even being a martyr. But he's saying, but if you do all of those things and you don't have love, it's meaningless. Pastor CJ, Paul, how do we preserve our oneness here at Plantation SDA? How do we preserve our oneness, our unity, our equality in the body of Christ while serving in our unique spiritual gifts? Paul lets us know. He says, listen, if you serve without love, it's meaningless. It's quiet right now. Is, 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 is that hitting somebody's pew? Is that what happened? Is that what happened? I'm just the messenger, just delivering the mail, okay? If you serve without love, the most excellent way, love being the most excellent way, then it's meaningless. And can we talk real talk this morning? It's like casual sex. It's like the act that people reduce that beautiful gift that God gave us in the garden to, when you reduce it to just an act, 
then you've robbed it of its beauty, holiness, and yes, pleasure that God originally intended for husband and wife in the safety and security of a lifelong, faithful, covenant, love relationship. And he made that thing to be good. He made that thing to, the church needs to reclaim and redeem that word from the world. Because they're having a subpar experience. I'm going to say it again, it's so good to me. And I'm married so I can testify. They're having a subpar experience of something that God made to actually reveal the intimacy and oneness in the Godhead. From eternity past. It's good. That was inclusive. And when God said he looked at everything he made, including that, and he said, ooh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. First command Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. It's good. Before sin. So we need to take back that language and actually present before them the beautiful thing and the context, the context by which he says it flourishes, and that's in marriage. Because when it is robbed of that beautiful context and that beautiful, yes, pleasurable and electrifying experience, come on, let all the husband and wives say amen. If you're quiet, that's all right. Just look with me straight here. We're, we're, we're all right. And, 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 and so he says, listen, when you don't have that type of experience in that context of marriage, then listen, you're having a subpar experience that's robbing you and ultimately leading you to self-destruction. And in a similar way, Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. Somebody wants to go there with me really quick. Matthew chapter 7. Just go with me real quick. Matthew chapter 7. This is the heart of what Jesus is getting at in the Sermon on the Mount. He's concluding his sermon and the praise team's about to get up and the disciples are getting ready to greet those that come down the aisle. You follow? And as he's talking, go with me now to verse number 22. Verse number 22. Verse number what? 22, and here's what he says. He says, many will say to me in or on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not, and you hear this spiritual gift, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, and by the way, names in the Bible are significant of character, in your character of love, Yahweh revealed in Christ. In your name, we cast out demons. We performed exorcisms. And in your name performed many miracles. And then he will say, I will declare to them, I never knew you. That's his point. I never knew you. Depart from me. In other words, you're not going to be happy here if we're not in love. And watch this. You who practice lawlessness, God's law, Whenever you see this in the Bible, no matter what context, God's law is a revelation of God's character of love. Jesus in flesh was the law incarnate. And so God's love, when it says you, pract you practice lawlessness, what it's actually saying is you who practice lovelessness. You have closed off from your heart the ability to love well. It's not arbitrary on God. This depart from me that Jesus is saying here is not like, oh, that was one too many times. Close the gates of heaven. No. By what you've demonstrated and what's actually in your heart, which is lovelessness, you have said, I don't want to be here, and I'm going to give you what you want. We don't know each other. There's no intimacy. There's no relationship. There's no abiding in Christ as a result of the gospel. And this is why love is the excellent way. This is why when we come to the cross and we see the revelation of God revealed in Christ, we need to recognize, number one, that you can't produce the love that this excellent way is talking about. You can't produce it. It's not something you can muster. It's not like you can effort your way into it. White knuckle your way into it. Try harder. That's pointless. That's futile, or else Jesus would not have needed to come and die and rise and fill you with his spirit if you could just do it, yeah? So how do we get God's love abiding in the heart? 
Come on, be real with me, Pastor today. Be practical with me. How does this thing really work? I mean, I'm hearing this lofty language, but talk to me now. And I'm going to tell you, here's how it works. It works, number one, if you want to love others well, right? Love God, love people. If you want to love others well, then what you first need to do is not try harder to love. What you need to do is you need to fix your gaze on God's character of love. You need to see how deeply he loves you well. Intentionally, daily, in the book, where his story is unfolding. And every time you open the book, he's saying something and revealing something personally to you about him in an intimacy of relationship. Yada in the Hebrew and Gnosko in the Greek. It means an intimate knowing. I don't know you. It means we don't have an intimacy of relationship. It's very, that word, Adam knew his wife Eve and they produced a child. Now in marriage it has a sexual connotation. So God's not applying that part to himself. But he's giving you a window into what he's seeking. What he's always wanted from every human being that breathes. Intimacy of relationship. And in that experience, when you come to this book and you see his love unfold from Genesis to Revelation, it's there everywhere. But it's most vividly revealed in the first four books of the New Testament. In the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Messiah. An excellent way. Embodied and enfleshed. When I look at that cross, I see my value, I see my worth. You need to do that every day when you come to this book. He's everywhere. But then what you want to do, and just add this to your prayer life in your time with Jesus Christ, what you want to do is you want to say, Holy Spirit, because Romans 5, 5 says the love of God is poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is wherever Jesus is. It's his job to actually bring Jesus close and reveal him to us and form us into his likeness. And so wherever you're focusing in on Jesus, that's where the Holy Spirit is. That's why when you receive Jesus, you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And not just once when you get baptized. When you look at that parable of the virgins, right? The five foolish and the five wise. A big part of that was that they did not continue with the oil. Are you following me? This, I didn't say this. You're getting this. I didn't say this earlier. So you just get there. It's just Holy Spirit right now. So, so the Holy Spirit takes that love that you see in Jesus on the cross, and he forms it in you in that daily relationship. So every day you should be saying, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh. Form me into the love of God that I see in Christ. This is why I've been so privileged to develop a resource called Life in Christ, Daily Devotional Journal, to help people have this experience practically. I feel so, before anybody starts studying any of the 28, I teach them how to have a relationship. Because then the 28 will make sense. They'll have their context. They'll be beautiful, actually, when you know Jesus. So love, that word gets thrown around a lot, does it not? And so Paul, now knowing that there's a variety of ways that people describe love and there's, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding of the word love, he now begins to tell us what love looks like, beginning in verse number four. Go with me there. Verse number four, back in 1 Corinthians 13, here's what he says. Love is patient. Love is what? It's patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. I'm reading from the NASB. It does not seek its own. In other words, it's not self-seeking or selfish. Is not provoked or easily provoked in some translations. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. I'm so tempted right here. Because there's a lot of people in our country right now that wants to believe lies. And if I see my Bible when it talks about this country, it seems to talk a lot about deception in Revelation 13, verse 11 to 18. It's important for us to rejoice in the truth. Amen? And the truth about God actually is his love, but I'm going to keep moving. Bear all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Why, Paul? Why did, you, why did you actually have us walk through all these attributes of love, right? Well, I believe there's two reasons here in the text. Reason number one. 
This church in Corinth and Greece, at the time that Paul's writing this, were struggling with bearing this fruit. By the way, this is actually coinciding with the fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians 5, 22. He's basically saying the same thing. All of these things are ingredients that when you mix them together, reveals love. The fruit of the Spirit is actually the character of Christ and of the Father. Which leads to why I believe it's his second reason for mentioning these things, verses 4 to verses 4 to 7, and that is because what he's describing there actually is the character of God, Dane. And that applies to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have all existed, the all three, the triune God, has existed from all eternity past, ever in an ebb and flow of overwhelming, indescribable Love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that was so powerful in experience that they had to create a universe where others with free will could experience it themselves. It was so good. And I want you to try something really quick with me. Please forgive me if it feels a little awkward. Take your finger and go like this. Some people are a little timid. All right, there we go. There we got some bold saints in the house. Now go right here to your rib and try and wiggle that a little bit. Does that tickle? Of course not, right? But if someone's sitting next to you and, uh, you know, you may not want to do that. Um, or if we do do that, there may be some numbers exchanged later. I don't know. But take your finger and you just do like that. Someone else does it and you get a sensation, don't you? It only works when you have someone else do it to you, doesn't it not? It's a tickle, yes? This is how love works. In order for you to experience love, there can't be a single solitary self, just you. There has to be an other. It's self-sacrificing. It's other-centeredness. It's, it's, it's giving. And you need an other for, for you to experience that. That's why God in, in his nature is more than one single solitary self, or else we could not say with intelligence, God is love. That's why he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because he is love. He's community. He's relationship. And so what Paul is saying here is, listen, family, how do we, what, what, what's the best way, Right? And it's the excellent way of love. And so the excellent way of love, he's saying, preserves our oneness while we serve with a variety of spiritual gifts because it reflects the way of the Godhead. It reflects the way of the Godhead. It's kind of like me and my, my wife, Deidre, that beautiful woman you saw that just, just floated in here from, from the clouds of heaven that sat here with our children. Can all the husbands say amen? Amen. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm preaching a little happy right now because, you know, hallelujah. So, when we love one another, the way we treat each other, the way we love one another, the way we interact with our kids, they start to mimic it. So, so, so we're very, like, lovey-dovey. We like to hug and, 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 and you know, we like to, to play and all that kind of stuff. And so they start to do that hugging and, and, and interacting with each other, Right? But then when we say to my son or, or my daughter, we say, hey, no, get down from there. Don't touch that. Don't put that in your mouth. Well, we're finding now that our daughter is saying that to my son who's a little bit older than her. No, 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 Tommy, because what? He's mimicking mom and dad. And listen, parents, you are the primary disciplers of your children. There's a partnership between church, school, and home. But listen, you're the primary disciplers of your, and you embody what you teach. So we can't say do as I say, not as I do. Because the main thing that they're hearing and learning from is who you are. This was discipleship in the first century with Jesus. The rabbi taught the disciples primarily by being. When he said, follow me, he said, you want to see how Sabbath is kept? Watch me. Chill, rest. Come unto me. And I'm going to give you some instructions now to unpack that for you, but it's what you saw in me. That's parenting. That's discipleship, right? Connect, grow, serve, go. So, so what we're seeing here is that if we want to know how to love as a family, and we want to be one, when you look at the Trinity, when you look at the Godhead, listen, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, each are love, and have all willingly, of their own choice, not arbitrarily, have taken on certain roles and functions, even for periods of time, to accomplish things for our benefit, our redemption, our salvation. Amen? Example, Jesus Philippians 1, Philippians 2, uh, 1 to 11, he humbled himself, right? He became flesh, took on the form of a servant, died to death on the cross. He did that for a time. 
And then he was exalted and went back, right? Equality with the Father, you follow? But he did that willingly. Mm, oh, oh, man, I'm sitting. I got, the, the, the brother has to preach. I, I, can't, I can't park too much. But the idea here is, because this informs how we should exist in marriage and in the church, but I'm going to stick on church. The idea here is, is that in the church, then therefore we need to be one. And therefore we need to be able to function in our unique gifts, but still be equal, still be, right, loving, right, still be one. One gift, me standing up here is not more important than you and what you're called and gifted to do. You're a minister of the gospel if you've named the name of Jesus Christ, whatever sphere of influence you have. My function and role is just different. And so if we're going to be able to love, we need to love like the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son love. Their interworkings within the God and how they relate with us. We're their children. We need to actually follow in their ways, and it's the excellent way of love. But Paul now wants to let us know how long that kind of love will last, because we need something that's going to last. Amen? Go to verse 8. Verse 8, the Bible says, love never what? It never fails. Somebody right now that's right now in a dark place, and you're wondering if God really loves you, you need to come back to verse 8. Because it could, also, it could also be said his love for you never fails. Never. It just keeps going. It will pursue you to the end. Ultimately, it's your choice to respond, but you will never, never fail. But listen, well, listen to what he says here. This is important. But if there are gifts of prophecy, hello, they will be done away. Oh, watch out. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Uh-oh. For we know in part, this is Paul speaking, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. And listen, here's that famous verse, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. When I was immature in my walk with Jesus, I was, I was speaking immaturely, I was understanding immaturely, and that's okay because you're a child. But at some point, he says, I, you know, after reasoning like a child, after thinking like a child, he says, but when I became a man, in other words, when I grew up to become an adult spiritually, I did away with childish things. Now, here's where we got the inverse often in the churches. We think that when Paul talks about meat versus milk for little babes spiritually, we think that he's talking about some, some specific things. But how many of you know that the actual meat of the word is the love of God. How, how easy was it? How easy was it for you not to say the wrong thing to somebody this week? How easy was it for you not to engage in that futile debate that was happening online? How easy was it for you not to say the wrong thing to your spouse or your children? How easy is it for you to love? Why did Jesus need to come and cover our sins? Because our sins were a result of lovelessness. Lawlessness is lovelessness, your inability to love. Therefore, that lovelessness needs atoning, which is in itself a work of love and grace. So no matter which way you start, it's going to come right back to love. And so what Paul is saying, listen, family, what he's saying here is, he's saying the excellent way of love it preserves our oneness while serving in a variety of spiritual gifts. Listen, because it, it's eternal reality, love, it's eternal reality will outlast your gifts. Did you hear that? It's eternal, love's eternal reality will outlast your gifts. You may be a good singer. I don't consider myself to be the greatest preacher. I just love Jesus. But I'm telling you, it's functional for a period of time, i.e., until Jesus returns. We're going to probably do some pretty amazing things in glory, but guess what? Right now, Dane, you have an excellent voice. You can play the guitar. I'm blessed. But it will cease. You'll transition into a greater glory. But love will always remain. Therefore, the primary focus of the believer, how do I love well? 
whether they are left or right, red or blue or purple, somewhere in the middle, I love you. I care about you. How's your family? How are your kids? Can I do a well check? You need some food. Does a bill need to be paid? Love one another. So simple, but yet so hard. That's why we need Jesus. It's like if you were one day to wake up and say, you know what, I really need to deepen the quality of my friendships and my relationships. And you say to yourself, you know what, I need to really evaluate these relationships because some of them I think might be depending on me because of what I do for them. And when life hits like a pandemic, crisis reveals character. And it shows you in those type of difficult moments when you've got on your back and on your face who your real friends are. And the relationship needs to be based on knowing you and you knowing me, being with you and me knowing you, right? Being on who we are, we just love each other, right? And it can't be based on what we do for one another. And this is what's coming out in the text right now. Love is what's going to be forever. Get used to loving the person next to you because you're going to actually be with them for eternity. Love now. Love well. Your gifts and what you do for one another or outside in the world will cease. It has an expiration date. Love is the main thing. And it's the hardest thing for us to keep the main thing. The main thing. Love is the excellent way. Love went up to a hill called Calvary, embodied in a person. Love stretched his hands wide and allowed us to crucify him. Love went there and said, Father, <laughs> forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. They are acting a plumb fool right now. If they could see who I really were, they would fall on their knees and ask for mercy. But love got up on the third day and said it was worth it all because if I could show them the excellent way, somebody might come down the aisle and actually give their heart to me. Jesus is the excellent way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Family, the whole thing from start to finish is about love. Revealed in Jesus, revealed in you through the Holy Spirit. Shared amongst one another. That's it. That's the book. That's eternity. John 17, 3 will say it this way. Jesus in his prayer to the Father as we close. In his prayer to the Father, he says, this is equal. This is eternal life. That they, you, should know you, the true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He doesn't define eternal life, although this is true, as a duration of time or eternity. He defines it in its primary sense of relationship, of knowing God. And to know him is to love him. Are you experiencing that? Is that your reality? And is that so overwhelming and so overflowing and overflow out of your life that it's spilling over into everybody else in your midst? Are they irritating you to the point that you can't love? Really? Do you think that God doesn't get irritated with you? Oh, read the Bible. Oh, yes, he does. He has feelings. But his love never fails. Never. My son right now. Yes, Tommy, come on up, buddy. My son right now, God bless him. My son sometimes does things. We're going to be in the living room right now. Is that all right? My son sometimes does things, you know, as a parent, that disappoint, irritate, frustrate. But there are days where I've had, I've been at my wit's end. And this boy will just walk up to me, not knowing anything I went through that day. And he will, and this is, what I, this is how I describe it. He will hug me with his life. You ever got one of those hugs? And in that moment, I was literally on the verge of tears one day when he did that. And I said, Tommy, no, I didn't even tell him, actually. I felt that the Holy Spirit was saying to me, I'm hugging you through him. One pastor I really appreciate, Joseph Kabazi, said, he said that the church, all right, go to mom. He said that the church is the Holy Spirit with flesh on, with skin on. We can pray, God, be with me right now. Hug me, Lord. Embrace me, Lord. But he needs another person that he's feeling to actually do it. He needs us to love one another so that people can experience tangibly the love 
of God. He's desperate to love through you. It's good that he loves me, but he wants to love through me. He wants to love through you. Who wants to receive that today? You want to stand right now? Is that your prayer? Is that your desire? You want his love to permeate your life? Carry you through a pandemic? And yes, carry you through last day events? Then learn how to love. And learn how to love well. Receive his love. You may want to take the next steps. That's on the number right there. You're on online. You want to put something in the chat. Or you're here. You want to take those next steps. Please see someone here so that we can go ahead and get you on those next steps. But you want to pray now and say, God, I need the excellent way. I need Jesus. Then I invite you to pray now. Father in heaven, it's your breath that's in our lungs. It's your love that, fi that fills our very being. It's your way. It's your love that literally defines what flourishing in life actually looks like there is nothing literally nothing greater than your love we can't exhaust the subject there are 28 ways in our community of faith that we can talk about the subject because that is our fundamental belief love that's the premise through which we approach any subject the love of the father revealed in Christ placed in us through the spirit somebody's receiving that right now father and I pray that you'll seal that decision Holy Spirit, you are the guarantee, the seal of our guarantee of our inheritance. And you want to spend eternity with us. Father, teach us how to love. This is eternal life. Learning how to love is the quality and we can experience it right now. We thank you in advance. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in the lives of those who hear the word and apply it by the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Just remain standing as we sing our closing song. <laughs> great are you, Lord. How many know God is great? His love is just never ending, isn't it? He knows everything we've ever done and still loves us, still died for us and would do it again if he had to. Thank you, God. Let's lift up a worship to him today. Here we go, church. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore, you restore every heart that is broken. Again, say you give life, you give life, you are love, you are love, you bring life, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, restore, you restore every heart, every heart that is broken. Great.
this place. Let's sing. Come on, sing. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth, All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. me father God as we leave this place today we know that your love never leaves us father all we have to do is turn seek you first God and watch all the things we need in this life be added unto us but God like my brother CJ just said that all the things we know here will fail but what will never fail is your love help us to focus on that today God with all the stuff that's happening all the rising gas prices and, and inflation and all the rulings and just all this stuff that makes us and gives us anxiety Lord help us to turn our focus back to you to seek you first and your love and your righteousness and everything 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 we need will be added unto us help us to do that today and then to share that love with someone else, Father, so we can just bring as many people with us to heaven as we could possibly do and, and just have a big party with you, Lord, someday. We can't wait. And this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, let the church of God say amen, amen. and amen. Happy Sabbath, church. As you go in God today, you can, you can hang out with us a little bit, and we're going to sing some. Hey, I'm, I'm, oh, okay, come on up. No, I'm not going to sing. Guys, I just got a reminder for you as we talk about love and that, that expression of love being shown through us. If you want to be part of joining us as we show the love of Jesus to this city, on, right? Yeah. Stop at that table out there. Sign up. We want to be real to these people and show them Jesus. So I'm asking you, sign up outside. Get involved in our health fair July 9th training, July 23rd. I'll give it back to the singer. Amen. Amen. You can sing too. And we're inviting anyone who has that spiritual gift to come on up with us. I know my brother CJ has that spiritual gift of singing. I, I'm not, I'm not going to let him off the hook. Where's Deidre? She's somewhere, but if you could sing with us, come on down CJ, man. Come on. He's, he's drinking water. He's, he's, 
<laughs> Come on, let's do Great Are You Lord. Come on. Come on, CJ, man. Yeah. Listen to my people, they're, they're telling me, no, we just did the song, why are we doing it again? CJ, um, we're gonna recruit you. No, th don't look at me like that. We're gonna make you sing this new song that we just did today, is that all right? That's all right, it was all right. good. Let's, let's do it, let's do it. Sorry, we're switching it up. You have made me glad. All right, if you guys, if you guys know the song, come on, you can, you can put your hands together. But if you know the song, join along, sing it with us. Brother Keith, I need your movement, man. <laughs> praise God, praise God. The song says, I'll give thanks to you, Lord. Come on, let's sing it, family. I'll give thanks to you, Lord. And sing praise to your name, O Most High. I'll declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O oh Lord, have made me glad. I will sing for joy at the works of your hand and rejoice in what you have done. I'll give thanks to you, Lord. To you, Lord. And sing praise to your name, O Most High. I'll declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O oh Lord, have made me glad. I will sing for joy at the works of your hand and rejoice in what you have done. And rejoice in what you have done. I can rest, I won't be defeated, Lord, for you are the strength of my life. For you, oh Lord, have made me glad, I will sing for joy at the works of your hand, and rejoice in what you have done, and rejoice in what you have done. Oh Lord, how great are your words. Great are your works. Let's say it outside. Oh Lord, how great 
are your works? Lord, you're good, so oh Lord, how great are your works? You guys look like you want to sing again. Hi, thank you for watching our live stream today. We hope that you were blessed and enjoyed today's service. Until we stream live again, I'd like to encourage you to visit PlantationSDA.tv for more uplifting content. If you have a prayer request, please drop by PlantationSDA.org and let us know how we can pray for you. And if you're in the Plantation, Florida area, please stop by and say hello. See, See you soon. soon.